Holiday season is approaching, so go to gameofmicrophones.com and click our Amazon link to do your holiday shopping. Prices will stay the same, but Game of Microphones will get a little finder's fee for everything you purchase during that session. Tyrion of the House Lannister, you stand accused by the Queen Regent of regicide. Did you kill King Joffrey? No. Did your wife, the Lady Sansa? Not that I know of. How would you say he died, then? Choked on his pigeon pie. So you would blame the bakers? Or the pigeons, just leave me out of it. Seven blessings, wet nurses and milk brothers, and welcome to Game of Microphones. I'm Lord Sterling, Sir Duncan, subspace diver. And I'm Lady Rachel of House Fox, breaker of wine glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and this is episode 78. On this episode of our series rewatch, we're covering Game of Thrones, season four, episode six, The Laws of Gods and Men. And in case you're not already aware, this series rewatch is from the perspective of someone who's current on the show. That means you've seen all the way up through season seven. So if not, there's still time for your father to sentence you to death, so you don't have to hear any of these spoilers. Warning. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> all right, let's jump right into it. What do you got for number five, Lady Rachel? Okay, number five, I have Bravos. Nice. Yes, I believe this is the first time we see Bravos in the series. I think so too, and it's this is also one of my numbers here. Um, okay. Number two, Master of Persuasion, basically okay. Bravos. So <laughs> we'll, we'll collab a little bit. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I love the opening of this episode because we get a glimpse of how amazing that titan statue of bravos actually is yeah fucking massive gigantimous (laughs) and it's i mean it's great cgi it looks beautiful there and you know this is this is kind of an important scene for the viewer because we finally get a glimpse of the Iron Bank and the Iron Bank has kind of been looming honestly I believe from season one if I'm not mistaken because oh god we do learn that the kingdom is in debt when uh, yes. when Eddard takes over his hand and it's revealed that Robert has put the kingdom in like you know bazillions of, debt. <laughs> of dragons of debt yeah so we we know that the kingdom has been in debt from the beginning of the show. We hear bits and pieces of the Iron Bank throughout the show. We hear a little bit of it from Tyrion. We hear a little yep. bit from Littlefinger. We hear a little bit from Tywin. And Tywin's really kind of the catalyst of making us realize that the Iron Bank is a force to be reckoned with. Right. Tywin's like revealing all the threats this season. The Iron Bank, the dragons. He's getting nervous. <laughs> He's the only one yeah. that seems to see that there's all these looming threats, like you were saying. Yeah. I also think in this episode, Varys shows a little bit of nervousness because Cersei is kind of, which will go in the small council, I'm sure, but mm. she's like baby dragons. And he goes, they grow larger every year. Yeah. Like, you're stupid if you think that they are not a threat. Yeah. Oh, they're just tiny dragons. No, they're fucking dragons. You know. <laughs> they're freaking huge. And we, we actually see that in this episode, how big Drogon is getting. Yes. That's, I mean, even at that size, they're dangerous. Um, oh, my God. At that size, they're, <laughs> they're super You know what dangerous. I mean? It's like yeah. baby, baby dragons. Like, well, they're freaking the size of a freaking pickup truck. So they can do some very 
Oh, yeah, they lit up Yunkai, or with no Astapor, um, when they were like a fraction of that size. I know. You know? So it's, it's very ignorant of Cersei to even say that. So I, I love that we kind of see the man behind the curtain, if you will, which is the Iron Bank. Yeah. And they sit there and make Stannis wait. Because he goes, we've been here since midday. Right, yeah, that's a pa- total power move, you know? <laughs> yeah, or, you know, disrespect of someone's time is yeah. you know, definitely a power play. And I like when Davo says, Easterners have a different sense of time. Uh, that's funny. And I wasn't sure if that was kind of foretelling to something or it was just you know, a passing comment because he spent a lot of time in Essos and Bravos and knows that, you know, maybe it's like island time. Yeah, maybe it's it's like a a little clue from his like inter uh, interactions with Salador San. Time even is an issue with Salador in this episode too. He's like, actually, there is no time. We got to leave in the morning. You know? Exactly. So finally, the workers at the Iron Bank sit down and they ask Stannis to sit and Stannis tries to power play them back. I, I feel mm. that he's looking at them and he doesn't sit right away and neither does Davos. And it isn't until Stannis finally sits down that the people at the iron bank start talking to him. True. So it's like, okay, you can stand there, but we're just not going to, talk to you like you're gonna sit in front of us to have this conversation it was interesting how they all walked in together and all sat at exactly the same time too like in synchronicity and i was thinking oh man are these all faceless men (laughs) right yeah it was very eerie how they were almost robotic yeah totally very calm um detached from all type of emotion Mm -hmm. their game is numbers it's not birthright, it, and they go into that about yeah. You know, Westeros's books are full of, you know, words like usurper and rightful heir, and our books are full of numbers and less open to interpretation. Yes, we yeah. prefer the stories that numbers tell. I like that. Um, like I like that's why I like math. You know, two plus two will always be four, no matter what. You know, the exactly. laws of math are <laughs> they are what they are. And uh, that's comforting. <laughs> I also noted that the Iron Bank brings to Stannis's attention that they have already spoken with Tywin. Right. Uh, seems like multiple occasions because when the story is told that Stannis is the rightful heir to the throne, that Tommen is a bastard, he the Iron Bank goes, you know, well, we have a very different story. And, you know, we just hear that you're a jealous uncle trying to take the throne from your nephew, essentially. (laughs) Yep. And so that's a hint that Tywin has been in contact with the Iron Bank. We don't really know what for, which I find kind of interesting if it's to negotiate an extension on the debt. Yeah, probably something like that. If it's to borrow more money. Probably that too. (laughs) We don't really know. So I found that kind of interesting. And... I know that we don't really get a closure to that because Tywin ends up dead shortly after this episode. But what? Spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> I didn't uh, know that. Oh, my God. You ruined it for me. <laughs> so, you know, it, it could play into why he's been so nervous about the Iron Bank the past couple of episodes. You know, he's been having discussions with them. Maybe they're threatening him. Maybe yeah. they trying to work a deal i mean this that's is a good interpretation I, I like that that's probably why it's coming up more he's probably getting the uh getting the squeeze a little bit from them <laughs> yeah so i just thought that that was kind of interesting and of course it's all speculation because it never really plays out in the story itself but right I just feel like that could add some weight to why a powerful man like tywin is starting to sweat the iron bank they're definitely they're after him and I do like when they start going into the numbers, like how many fighting men do you have? How many ships do you have that aren't at the bottom of the Blackwater? And then they ask about how many supplies that they're able to produce for those men on Dragonstone. And 
you know, they don't like the numbers that they are being provided. Yeah, you can see why these numbers seem unlikely to add up to a happy ending from our perspective. <laughs> yeah, because they're they're basically doing the statistics. Like if we if we lend you money and you end up not paying it back, like what do we have to take of yours essentially? You mm -hmm. know, so can we possess repossess of yours? That you and also just what are the odds of you being able to pay us back? Exactly. I mean, they're not they don't produce any type of supplies, renewable supplies um, on Dragonstone. Yeah. 32 ships, like, that's not a lot of ships. No, that's, no, that's like nothing. And that's that makes it even more interesting, too, how they end up giving um, a big loan to the Night's Watch later on as well, right? Yeah, that's right, they do. Because the Night's Watch, Watch doesn't produce anything, you know? So how are they expecting that's to get right. paid back? Maybe they're they banking on their... John... Like taking the Iron Throne or something. That's right. I forgot because the Night's Watch gets kind of all their supplies from the gift and the people that kind of run that area, the farmers that farm that land. Mm. Yeah, true. So I I loved the sentiment that over in Bravos, thieves are not rewarded with titles. Yeah, that was funny too. And it was, a, you know, obviously a dig at Davos. <laughs> he was so slick about it, though. Well, strictly speaking, I didn't do the thieving. That would be the pirates. I just, I just moved, moved the shit. from <laughs> one place to another. I love Boss, Davos. zing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's a fucking champion. So we find out that Tywin is 67 years old. Right. And That's old as fuck for Westeros. Yeah, I was going to say that's quite old for this time frame or this time period that, you know, this kind of takes place in. And I believe he's the only character we get an exact age on. Mm. In, in On the, the show. show. Yeah, that, maybe that's right. Um, I know you get ages in the books. Yeah. But ages are not clear in the show and i think they do that kind of on purpose because they've purposely aged up many of the characters yeah to more relatable and they and don't want to like rub it in and piss off book readers so they just make it kind of ambiguous probably <laughs> something like that yeah because i mean even for example tom and he's only supposed to be like what 11 or 12 right now a wee, so, wee little boy yeah he's not even a teenager and so to have him get get married it's kind of and getting, you know, getting freaky and whatnot. Yeah, so I, I see why, but they specifically call out Tywin's age, and I think you hit it on the nose. It's because it's to show us that 67 is old yeah. in, in this world. That's an old number. And yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's not really old in our world anymore, but it's old here because the sentiment is when Tywin is gone, who are you going to back? Mm-hmm. So, uh, like Jamie's in the King's Guard, Cersei's crazy, <laughs> and Tommen's a little boy. Tommen's a little boy. So, but Stannis, Stannis is a proven prime. battle commander. He's in his prime. He has the blood right. You know, he's got he's got everything. Yeah. So I and he makes a good a good. Davos is a great speaker because Davos has a similar scene like this with John in front of Lyanna Mormont. Oh yeah, true. Very, he's quite a diplomat. He's uh, yeah, he's very eloquent and he's he he understands people. You know, he's got the street smarts, so he knows like from his time as being a smuggler and whatnot, a criminal. He's very slick, so he he understands people's psychology. He knows what makes them tick. He knows what to say to to like. He knows what they're worrying about, what will make them confident. So he knows exactly what to say to uh, to make them realize that Stannis is a smart, safe bet to at least bet on both sides of the war in this case. Yeah, I mean, and he's a quick thinker, too. You know, he's he comes up with great responses that aren't just funny, but they're actually like there's depth to what he's saying. And I love that he shows them his fingers. Nubs. The nubs. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag so, nubs. <laughs> the nubbins. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and it's it really drives his point home that 
Stannis is a man of his word. He takes oaths very seriously. He was punished for his quote unquote crimes of being a smuggler, but was also rewarded the title because he did save a population of people from perishing, from dying. So yeah. <laughs> he he gets punished and rewarded in the same act. And to the Iron Bank's perspective, you know, he paid his debt. Like and Stannis so did of his word. Yeah, and Stannis, like he said, uh, he, Stannis doesn't just talk about paying people back like the Lannister. There's a dig at the Lannisters. A Lannister always pays his debts, you know. Exactly. He does it. Like, he fucking cut my fingers off, and I, I still back him, you know what I mean? And I still respect him and know that he is the rightful heir, which he is. I mean, yeah. this thing <laughs> about true. this argument is he does have the most legitimate stand or claim to the throne at this yeah. point in the story because Tommen is a bastard. Mm -hmm. So, and Stannis is the oldest and only living true Baratheon. Heir, yeah. So, it, it is true. So, I, find, I found this scene a really good one as far as momentum of the story kind of unveiling this scary creature called the iron bank mm -hmm. and getting a glimpse of you know kind of their their power and their power play and how they manipulate you know making him wait not talking to him until he sits down and being very matter of fact and unemotional they don't yeah, very care. logical yeah they just care about like how do we get our money back if we <laughs> yep. you know, lend you some? So continuing with Bravos, we meet Salador San. We do. <laughs> and I love him. <laughs> yeah, same here. Uh, this is my number five. Bring me my brown pants. <laughs> okay. Yes. And so Laura, we actually see Laura in later episodes. She is Arya. Oh, really? Yes, she is Arya's first client of the morning when Arya has her oyster cart. No way. Yes. Dude, you'll that's crazy. Yes, you'll see her again because she's a whore, so it's always her first customer because she's just getting off work. Good good call. Good catch. That's wild. I <laughs> yeah. And she's really sweet to Arya and she always and then she's in the whorehouse that Arya goes in with her oyster. Marin Trant. Yeah, and Lara's with a guy and you know he buys extra oysters because Lara likes Arya. Oh, that's so he funny. Likes you, you know, and so he buys some extra. So she does appear another couple of times in the show and I Good find Good for her. Funny. That's awesome. Yeah, that we see her in this episode. And I think my new favorite duo is Davos and Salador. Uh. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Their little banter, you know. You are not my friend. <laughs> you're not my friend, my friend. <laughs> or left another chest of gold at your house with your wife. <laughs> with your wife. <laughs> and the girls start laughing. Yeah, so, you know, he throws a ton of, are those, I couldn't tell, are those gold dragons or are they silver in those um those tubes it's the, probably the, gold but it didn't look too bright maybe it's just like not polished or something i know that's i was i i paused it but i couldn't really make it out if they were i i would assume that it's gold because they were just at the iron bank yeah and it's worth gold is just worth so much more than than silver it just makes sense that it would be gold yeah and so this is a clue that the iron bank has lent stannis money yep this yeah this confirms it yeah, so it's a very sly way of letting the audience know without being blunt about that the Iron Bank has funded Stannis at this point. At yep. least some some amount of money. Yeah, that and, was cool. They cut away from Davos making the argument, and then we see that it must have worked because he's got the money. I like that the way they did that. Yeah, and it, it's it's it stays true to the Iron Bank kind of being behind the curtain that we don't really know what the remaining conversations were with Stannis to get that money. Mm -hmm. and it's echoed with Tywin that clearly he's been in contact with the Iron Bank and we don't really know what they talked about either. 
Right. So they kind of stay hidden, even though we know who they are now. Yeah, pretty crazy. So that's all the notes I had on Bravos. Do you have any more notes on these couple of scenes? For sure. Let's see. Um, <laughs> there's some funny stuff worth mentioning, like... Um, when they're waiting for the for the bankers, Davos starts talking about one time I was waiting for Salador San here in Bravo. So there's another clue about the um, the different sense of time. Mm -hmm. um, I was waiting for Salador San here in Bravos. Together we were going to run three shiploads of the finest. He's talking about smuggling, and Dana, uh, Stannis like looks over like I don't want to fucking hear about your smuggling, dude. You know, okay. <laughs> and he, he shuts up <laughs> mid sentence, which is kind of funny. It's funny that. They're sort of there's this back and forth between the Stannis's story and Tywin's story, and it's all just this this he said she said bullshit, which is like you know the Iron Bank's just like oh drama, you know I, we just like yeah. what's true numbers, you know <laughs> they're just unemotional, it, like they just don't care. Yep, and um, so they they call Stannis Lord Stannis, and Davos corrects them and gives um, Stannis's titles, you know. All of them, and uh, it's just kind of funny because <laughs> when he introduces Jon Snow, King in the North, you know, to <laughs> Danny, Jon Snow, he's, he's the King, King in the, the North. North. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little less, um, you know, showy and flashy with with Jon Snow. It's just kind of funny the difference between the two of them. Definitely. But, uh, the uh, I also like how he he shows the nubs, and you know, this is the payment that was demanded by St King Stantis for my crimes. And this whole, um, this this whole like manipulate not manipulation but great argument that Davos shows you know does here, it it's basically foreshadowing his capability, and it's probably going to be important in season eight. It's, he's probably going to be doing important stuff for John and Danny. So I just thought it was good, uh, really cool. Yeah, he's definitely showing his. D um you know his diplomat skills yeah for sure these earlier episodes he's a he's a quick thinker for sure and it's funny because stannis is always telling him he's a slow learner mm -hmm. like right right okay, right he, he may be a slow learner but he is quick to think and he's he's very poignant with his words and they may be funny and they may be a little bit sarcastic but they Mean stuff. <laughs> mean stuff. Every single time Davos opens yeah. his mouth, he's, he's smart. Meaning something. Yeah. So that pretty much wraps up that scene. Then I got Ooh. a little more with uh, Saladar San. I think we should just talk about his his funny his pirate joke. You know yeah. how, how the, the captain's like, "There's two boats coming. You know, bring me my red shirt." And they're like, "Why do you want your red shirt? You know, before battle. So if I'm stabbed, you won't see me bleed, bitches. You know." <laughs> the next morning, oh my god, it's ten ships, we're surrounded. And everybody looks to the captain, waiting for his usual command, and calm as ever, he replies, bring me my brown pants, you know, <laughs> in case you, <laughs> so you won't see me Shit shit yourself. my pants, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great, and it also reminds me of that, that uh, U.S. Marine Corps chesty puller quote that I like to mention, where where he says, you know, someone's like, sir, we're surrounded on all sides. And he's like, great, then we can attack in any direction, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Cracks me up. Um, nice. That pretty much wraps up that scene, too. I just, you know, it's funny how he, he tells him that, you know, Saldor's surprised to see him. And he's like, join us. And he's like, oh, no time. You know, we sail at sunrise. And he's like, Saldor's like, uh, we, you, me, we, Davos <laughs> replies. <laughs> Once I thought this man loved me, you know, now I know he despises me. They just have a funny relationship, so it's cool to see uh, their their banter. and. Um, you can tell that they're very old friends. Yeah, and Solidor begrudgingly goes along. You know, he's a man, he's, a, he's all about that paper, you know, he's a man of, who's about his money. So when he finds out there's a chest at home and Davos drops that coin edge on the, on the edge of the tub, you know, he's in. Yeah, and I mean, you can even see the look on the horse faces. They're like, whoa, that's yeah. a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, and I, I do love it. You're not my friend, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like, how many times have you felt that way about your friends? 
<laughs> like, right. I totally. love you, but I hate you right I now. You, but I want to strangle you. <laughs> so classic. It's they're they're a good duo. Definitely. And they have in upcoming scenes and episodes, they they have some good banter as well. So they're they are a forgotten favorite duo of mine that I have come to remember how much I love their short scenes together. Nice. Yeah, same here. Same here, for sure. So that pretty much wraps all that up for me. How about okay. your number four? We need to do your number five. My number five was the brown pants. Oh, okay. Fabulous. So my number four is it's just Varys. Nice. And we've talked about this on previous episodes. I have brought it up before that Oberyn, they're in the throne room and Oberyn approaches Varys and calls him Lord Varys. Right. Yeah. He goes, it's only Varys. You know, actually, nobody is under any obligation to call me Lord. And yet everyone does. And yet everyone does. And he and just so, sort of nods powerfully as if saying, yeah, that pretty much speaks yeah. for itself, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, they're kind of, they're looking at each other. They're, they're having a nice conversation. You see the Iron Throne in the background. And again, we get a little bit more character development with Oberyn. Mm -hmm. And we, we find that he has spent time in... Essos, and he spent time in. Oh God, why am I blanking? Where the uns? He's seen the Unsullied. Where? Was yeah, in uh, Astapor. Astapor, and you know he. Although said, he could have encountered them in a number of places because they are sold all around the area. Yeah, he's he's said that they're quite impressive fighters. That he's spent five years in Essos and. You He's know, probably been influenced by their fighting style because you know, what's their weapon of choice? A spear. Right. And That's how right. does he fight the mountain? You know, yeah, with, with a spear. spear. So he's probably he's uh, quite good at it too. Yeah. So maybe he's like trained with the Unsullied at some point. You know, he's going around learning all these different styles and things like that. He was impressed by them. It makes sense. He would have probably, as a prince, had money to throw down to get some Unsullied style training. Training or just, you know, got the privilege to watch them enough to pick up being a skilled fighter. He just could watch them and pick up on, you know, some interesting moves. So I love his sentiment that most people live and die in the same corner of the world that they were born in. And, you know, he doesn't want to be like most people. And, and that reminds me of a quote that I heard recently, which is uh, the earth is a book. Those who do not travel it only read one chapter. Oh, that's a very, very good quote. I must yeah, say. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, so I, I liked, you know, hearing kind of his outlook on life and how he wants to live his life, and it's very in tune to what we kind of already know about Oberyn. Mm -hmm. That does make the point. Well, most of us are not princes. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like... Like it's, him growing up in squalor, selling every his body for, you know, just to survive. Exactly. And yet they're both standing in... In front of the Iron Throne. In front of the Iron Throne. So it's very telling kind of how far both of them have come because clearly we know that Oberyn does not like the Lannisters and he's there relatively peacefully he's kind of infiltrating king's landing he's now sitting on the small council he's for all intents of purposes as best as possible getting along with tywin you know i don't think they really like each other but they're also respecting each other's power Definitely. and varus being from essos particularly lease we discover Right, that's a crazy moment too, because um, Oberyn picks out his accent and he's like, "I've lost my accent entirely," and he's like, "I have an ear for that as well." <laughs> I know. I thought that was very interesting. I yeah. have that in my notes, and I'm like, "How do you know someone's lost their accent?" Just micro traces. Yeah, I know? mean, you have to have quite an ear for that accent to know that someone's lost it. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And Ferris is like taken aback, taken aback by that. Like you, the look on his face is pretty great. Yeah, it's really it's funny because so my grandparents, my mom was born in England. She came here as a very very young child, so she does not have an accent at all. But fucking my, red coat. 
my grandma and grandpa, <laughs> they do have accents and they've been here for 50 years, you know? And Interesting. so for me, actually longer, longer than that, they've been here for like 60 years now. Wow. <laughs> um, my grandfather is a doctor. He served in the British Navy and came over here to, to be an anesthesiologist. But cool. long story short, I forget that they have accents. Like, I don't hear it anymore in their voices. Interesting. But when I have, like, friends that meet my grandpa, because my grandma passed away a few years ago. Oh, I'm sorry um, to hear that. Yeah, thank you. Um, they immediately pick up on his accent, and I'm always like, oh, yeah, he does still have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> He's just my grandpa. I'm just so used to it. I know. I just don't even hear it anymore. But when I'm reminded of it, then I hear it again. And I'm like, oh, yes, you absolutely still do have your accent. Right. So, it's funny. Accents are funny. Yeah, definitely. So I love Oberyn. He's kind of, he's usually very intuitive. And in this scene, he's kind of assumes that Varys likes boys. Right. That's pretty funny, right? You know, we have some boys, some, you know, nice boys on retainer at Littlefinger. Lovely boys. <laughs> and You, you know, did like boys before. And he's like, no, I didn't like boys. Really? I girls? didn't like girls either. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. And this at this point, I'm like, for real? Like, that's, that's really weird, man. That's kind of crazy. You're, you know, a asexual. And he gives a pretty solid reason. I mean, yeah. it's not really arguable, the point that he makes. And I think being a eunuch and becoming a eunuch at a, at a young age probably allowed him to formulate this opinion a little bit better. That's true. He would have had to lower testosterone mm -hmm. levels from a very young age and may not like have, you know, undergone any puberty the way that would normally happen and may just never have developed sexual feelings. It's like desires. Yeah, exactly. It's weird. So very I mean, interesting psychology with various in this scene. Yeah. And I mean, that's a little bit of speculation because we know that he was a young boy, but I mean, a young boy, like six or 16, you know, that, that 10 year span it can be all the difference as far as like sexual development goes. So I love it. He said, when I see what desire does to people, what it does to this country, I am very glad to have no part in it. Yeah. Crazy. And it's a parallel kind of to the iron bank, to the iron bank. Exactly. Yeah, I was thinking he, the same thing has removed his emotions and we know that Varys's loyalties lie with the realm. Yeah, he's all calculations just like the numbers in the bank's uh, ledgers. Yeah, and then he goes the absence of desire leaves one free to pursue other things and such as And then Varys looks at the Iron Throne and the camera like pans into the Iron Throne and I thought that was really interesting because it leads you to believe that Varys may want to sit on the Iron Throne as kind of a first-time viewer. He basically implies it, you know. He's more direct about it with Oberyn than he's ever been with anybody about it. Like, yeah. he, like, you know, like, does free to pursue other things. And Oberyn says, such as, and he looks at the Iron Throne, like, I'm pursuing the Iron Throne. So he always has said that he serves the realm, you know, but maybe he thinks that, he'd be able to serve it best as king, you know, like better than anybody else would as king. Yeah, and the fact that people respect him enough to call him lord mm -hmm. on no obligation to call him lord is foretelling in the fact that he could kind of win like a democracy type Situation. Yeah, that he could be a king even though it's not in his blood. Just the way that like he's he's a lord even though he's not by popular a lord. demand. Yeah, by, kind of thing. by popular demand. I like that. That's fucking badass. Yeah. But, but people also may just call him a lord because they're terrified of him. <laughs> like, they might. Be, I better just I call him a lord and pretend like you know, like I respect him so he doesn't have me killed because he's probably spying on me at all times. Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> a level of fear and respect and a leader usually has a little bit of both of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
is a little bit of fear and it's it's varying degrees depending on who's sitting on the iron throne but fear respect and love are kind of the three you know aspects of a king or a queen and they all have kind of different different levels of each like cersei is mostly feared right and uh danny's mostly loved yep (laughs) you know and and john is respected john i was just gonna say i was gonna say i was gonna say someone else but it wasn't even a king i don't even know where my mind is at right now (laughs) but john (laughs) is respected so you know they all play a huge part and what's interesting enough is Varys, danny and John are all together in season seven. Right. And it's interesting too. It kind of alludes to that, that parable of like the, 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 the cell sword or the, the person who's getting commands, you know, do they listen to the King? Do they listen to the guy that's going to pay them? Or they do, do they listen to the, the Septon, the priest, you know? Um, and the, the, the iron bank had said in this episode there, you know, was it Davos said, well, who's the, who's the most powerful man in the kingdom? Seven Kingdoms. And they were like, Tywin Lannister, obviously. You know, and he's powerful because of his his money and his prestige. But it it's, could be argued that Varys is one of the most powerful men in the kingdoms as well. And for him, it's not money, it's information. You know? Yes. So there's, there's money as power, there's information as power, you know, and like, bri- like blackmailing or using information to, to control and manipulate. And then there's, there's love... That could be, um, you know, a motivation. Like you could add to the parable: Are you going to listen to the king? Are you going to listen to the the the, the guy who's going to pay you? Are you going to listen to the septon? Or are you going to listen to your mom? You know, like <laughs> where does your loyalty fall? Like, does it? Do you listen to someone who you love and respect? Do you listen to someone who's the, the head of the like the the leader? Do you listen to the money, or do you listen to the? Uh, you know, like the, the religious um, controllers. So it's just an interesting, um, you know, an interesting question of where does power reside? And obviously it resides with wherever the the subject of the question places it. But uh, basically um, love and respect is another element of the equation that could be added to figure out where people's loyalty lies. Is it from the leadership? Is it from money is it from religion or is it respect that's one that they could have included in the parable but didn't interestingly yes yes i find that interesting too because i think respect is a big one yeah totally <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the bigger ones in my opinion I yeah mean, definitely yeah so that was all the notes i had from my number four do you have any notes for this particular scene Sure. Uh, let's see. I noticed that the spikes around the pillars in the throne room match the spikes over the seven pointed star um, above the throne, like the like the glass thing, you know. Oh, that's cool. Which is cool. Yeah, they kind of like go out at the same angles and stuff. And I also noted that even though Joffrey's dead, the um, the seven pointed star above the throne has not yet been replaced with the Lannister lion. So they are still going along with the farce that Tommen is a Baratheon, I guess. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Do we know when the Lannister lion appears instead of the Seven Pointed Star? Like, I think it's when Cersei takes the throne okay. after Tommen's death, and she just like changes everything. You know, like paints the pillars black. Um, puts yeah, I the, noticed uh, that. Lion, the lion over the over the throne and. Just, you know, she's like, Lannister rules now. Oh, Doyle rules, you know. I was just going to say, oh, Doyle rules. That's so funny. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Oh, Doyle rules. Oh, Doyle, I got a feeling your whole family's going down. But for now, I got to study. So, yeah, basically, uh, it's kind of surprising that Varys look, look, gazes longingly at the Iron Throne like that. It's really interesting. And, yeah, that pretty much wraps up all my notes for that scene as well. Cool. So what is your number four? My number four is play a role. I want you to play a role. Okay. Which uh, refers to uh, Theon, or Reek, being asked to portray Theon. 
And so okay. before this he's some sorry. of my number three. Cool. Yeah. So let's uh, just talk about the uh, Dreadfort stuff in general, leading up to that because it's you know he doesn't get offered the role until he proves his worth. You know. Yes, that's my number is, three is. altogether. Is Theon's rescue and role play is what I dubbed it. Nice. So it starts off with Yara on her ship, and she's informing her crew of the Ramsay Bolton situation. She's reading his letter. You know, uh, send your ironborn out of the scum, uh, scum out of the north and back to those shit-stained rocks, etc. <laughs> I'll know, flay it's a horrible all. letter. <laughs> yeah, classic Ramsay, just ranting like a maniac. You know. So. Uh, And it's cool because she's reading this, and as the letter is being read, it sort of transitions from reading the letter into a montage of them, like, approaching the castle in the darkness and sexy time with Miranda and Ramsay, you know, doing (laughs) doing stuff to her and (laughs) and everything. Oh, my God, yeah. (laughs) And so I thought it was a cool montage leading up to the stealth invasion, and then the guy leans over the crenellation and gets an axe to the forehead and they infiltrate, and they're killing all these guys, and she takes a hostage who leads them to the kennels where Theon is, and then she's like, thank you, and like slits his throat. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of um, Yeah, it reminds me of the song Criminal by Eminem, where there's like an interlude in the middle of the song where he, he goes in, and he's robbing a, a convenience store or something, he's like, put the fucking money in the bag, bitch, and I won't kill you, and she's like, don't kill me, don't kill me, I have kids at home, and he's like, she puts the money in the bag and he goes, Thank you! Windows tinted on my ride when I drive it. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> yeah. think I remember that. That's yeah, cool. it's brutal. So, same same thing, Yara. Basically, you know, Eminem's that guy, <laughs> which is pretty funny. And then Theon is mixed in with all the dogs and he. <laughs> I keep calling him Theon here. What is wrong with me? Theon is dead. Theon no longer exists at Theon this point. Theon slash Reek. Yeah, this is Reek. Uh, full Reek. So <laughs> he's in the last cage on the right. And <laughs> he, he, she's like, we're, this, we're going home, Theon. And he is freaking out. He's She knocks the lock off. She goes in to grab him. And he's like pressed back in the corner and he's looking away from her towards the door yelling no i don't believe her i know who i am i'm reek reek loyal reek good reek i've always been reek you know (laughs) and it's like wow alfie allen plays this scene so well yeah the fear in his eyes and just the terror and oh man the brainwashing is set in real deep you know real fucking deep time so they drag him out of the cage and they're starting to kind of walk towards the uh, the door and they the alarms have sounded and one of them's like, we can't get trapped in here. You know, it's a dead end. We got to get out. We got to get out. And then Ramsey strolls in shirtless, <laughs> armorless, more importantly. I know, with like blood all over him. Yeah. And that's just a fucking, that's like Ramsey in a nutshell, in a nutshell yeah. right there, you know? And so A, we learned a couple things that He's fucking crazy. He's not wearing armor. Um, we also learned that he must be able to hold his own in a fight, which we haven't really seen yet. Because um, there's blood all over him, and he had to have killed a few people to make his way here. Um, and then he, uh, it, it's, he, he has a great line. This is turning into a lovely evening. Because <laughs> yeah, he just got freaking... <laughs> yeah fuck the shit out of by what's her face miranda yeah. <laughs> and now yeah. he's killing people <laughs> yeah totally and then he just charges in leading the charge without any armor or anything like a maniac and reek is just chanting still reek i'm reek loyal reek you know <laughs> and my name uh, is reek yeah <laughs> reek reek it rhymes with weak and uh um so they, they, the battle ensues, and they sort of get switched around, and Theon's back in the cage after he bites Yara's hand, which, which is I fucking find crazy. interesting. Just like because, a dog, you know? Yeah, he's in the kennels, and he bites her like a dog would bite her. So. Yeah. So they go, sort of get switched around, and now Ramsey's in between Reek and Yara, and uh, he's like, you've got bigger balls than he ever did, you know, talking about <laughs> Theon. And we know he had a big dick. Um, so, uh, you know, his balls are probably pretty big, too. So that's kind of a compliment to Yara. 
<laughs> like you're a pretty badass girl, you know. <laughs> he got a big package, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then he's like, "But with those big balls of yours, how fast can you run?" You know, and that's when he starts unlocking the hounds, and Yara's like, "We gotta get the fuck out of here." So the Ironborn retreat, and it's uh, you know they make for the ship. Make for the ship now, she says, and the guy's like, "But your brother," and it's real sad as she like you know, articulates her realization that my brother is dead, you know, he's fucking gone. And man, that brainwashing is powerful. If your sister's there and she's trying to rescue you and he like, doesn't, doesn't even like recognize the reality of the situation, you know, he's just like, thinks thinks it's it's a trick. trick. Yeah. It's fucked up. And, uh, then it, it cuts to the next scene where he gets called in to, for his reward, you know? And, and um, Ramsey is saying to him, you know, the, those creatures who came in the night, they wanted to take you away, and you didn't let them. You remained loyal. And he's like, you, they, you can see how thick the brainwashing is again. He's like, I, I didn't want them to take me. I was so scared, you know. I didn't want them. Yes. Because I yes, think he Reed. thought he was in trouble. Yeah. I think he was trying to plea, like, I did everything I could to get away from these people. I was afraid. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, uh, he's like, yes, yes, Reek, you know, I know you, you're not in trouble, you know. This is a reward. It's a bath for you. And and Reek is like, oh, oh, you know, he's too, he doesn't know what to do. So he's like, remove those rags, you know, and he hesitates now. And so we, he starts taking off his shirt, and we see how brutal his torment his has been. His scars, oh my god. Everywhere. And we see that he's missing a nipple. His right nipple's gone. It's all scarred over as well. And he has an X on his arm. Mm. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah, so uh, we basically, uh, this also reminds me of what I said in our last episode, talking about the psychological conditioning that we see with Liza, like squeezing Sansa's hand and tormenting her, and then, it's okay, my darling. You Consoling. Know, and like, yeah. Yeah, I have that in my notes, that yeah. you said that last episode. Yeah, yeah, that whole pimp thing of, like, torment your subject and then reward them with a bath, you know, <laughs> which is exactly what happens <laughs> it's here. It's exactly what happens. So funny. So then, you know, Theon's hesitant to take off his pants because he's probably ashamed of his, his whole, uh, you know... Cockless. So do you think he cut the balls off too, the pillar and the stones, or uh, just, just his dick? Good question. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. What I do think, you think he probably took it all. Ugh. Man. Like, just... I, I don't see Ramsey like, leaving any of that behind. I mean, maybe the Unsullied might have just been castrated, like they still have their... Uh, I don't think so. No? Yeah, probably not. Especially because they're all like, you know, they're not like very muscular and stuff, and but they want to take the fight the, out of them. Like they don't the want them te- to resist. But that's that comes from the testicles. That doesn't come from like. That's what I mean. That's why I think that they probably were castrated. Yeah, but they left the penis. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I always kind of got the impression it was <laughs> it was all gone, but you know, uh, I've I've got the impression that the Unsullied still had their penis Ugh. or castrated like how you would castrate like neutered oh yeah i think theon was like more like mutilated full castrated yeah and i think varus might be the same way as the ins- as theon and the fact that he was mutilated because he needed because he he said my parts right plural yeah plural yeah yeah, that's so, fucking brutal. I just keep thinking, like, imagine the healing process if you, like, have to pee. <laughs> I was wondering, oh. like, how, if you are missing that member, how do you pee? Well, you have, a, like, there's a sphincter that's, like, your, like up, up your urethra at the base of the bladder. That's where you control it from. So it basi- oh, you're basically yeah. just turned into, like, a, like a, female a female anatomy at that point, you know? But it's in the front of your body and not, right. like... But it wants yeah. to scab, and, you know, every time you got to pee, it's got to, like, oh, it's got to be brutal, you know? Like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's really, really... Yeah, gnarly. so I think I think Theon is missing everything. I think the Unsullied... Yeah, I think so, too. ...their testicles, and I think Varys is missing everything. Well, in that case, uh, maybe uh, maybe Missandei did get a lot of stuff done. 
<laughs> all kinds of things. You know? I that's that's where I kind of thought about that. It's like you know, I hope so. Because they're castrated, like being castrated or neutered, essentially, it, it serves the purpose of what they need to remove the testicles for. But it would they would still have their their dicks, and then they were they might still have other inclinations besides what they're trained to do. So I think they removed it all. Mm-hmm. Sadly. Okay. Interesting. Sadly, yeah, it's pretty pretty messed up. So um, Theon removes the britches, and Ramsay smiles creepily Ugh. as he sees the disfigurement that he created, and it's just fucking gross, man. Ramsay is the worst. And then there's like sort of semi homoerotic vibes with Ramsay again here, where he's like starts bathing him. He's like, Reek, do you love me? You know, do you, you love me, love Reek? Me. <laughs> oh, and he looks so creepy when he says, "Yes." I, you know, of I course, do, my he lord. Would, he gets like he gets all like kind of wide eyed. He's like, yeah, <laughs> good because I need you to do something for me, something very important. You know, there's a castle. You see, some bad men hold this castle. I need your help to take this castle back. And Reek's like, but, but how can I need you to play a role to pretend to be someone you're not? P- pretend to be who? Theon Greyjoy. And that's just like so fucking twisted, man, to destroy his identity and then to tell the new him to pretend to be the, the old, old him. him. Oh my God. That's like. Talk some, about a mind fuck. Yeah, that's like next level psychological torment and manipulation. God damn, dude. That's like a few levels up there. <laughs> For sure. Fucking crazy. So that pretty much wraps up all my notes for that scene. It's just fucked up, man. I do just, I know I said it earlier, but I do have to just compliment Alfie Allen. Oh, yeah. On his acting skills as Reek. When he's in the cage, that look on his face is like pure, pure terror. Terror. And even the little nuances in the bath scene of like, like when the water goes down his back and he like flinches and his eyes are going. Oh away. man. And then he kind of like relaxes into it. I mean, it's so believable. He does. Phenomenal. phenomenal. Oh, <laughs> truly, truly. I mean, it's one thing to like play a crazy person like Ramsey and to get all like weird and crazy and, you know, get that kind of like wild, wild eye, but it's a complete another dimension that you have to kind of go into to play someone who's like lost who was once sane who has lost their mind yeah it's 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 really remarkable and it's it's universally agreed that uh that alfie allen just killed this role like nailed yeah it, you know he nailed he nailed it the panic the terror the the look on his face especially in the um the kennel mm-hmm and he's like backing up and it's just, he looks clinically insane. Yeah. Which is, and, you know, sadly, because he's been tortured to be insane, not because he's like Ramsey and was right. insane. Yeah, it's, secondary psychopathy. Or, yeah, yeah, so I just, I, I had to give a shout out to Alfie because that is quite the acting in in this episode for Definitely. him. Definitely. And uh, I just, just had a... A, um, a connection form in my brain a second ago made me think of um, a couple of few seasons ago in The Walking Dead. One of the main concepts they had was, you know, Rick was kind of losing his mind and people were like Carol had gone kind of crazy. And um, the question was like, when you're going through all this torment and struggle and you're losing yourself, can you come back? You know, and that was like one of the main focuses of the season, we don't get to come back, you know, Rick or whatever. And then like, yeah. so, but they sort of do end up getting to come back and we get to see that as well with, with Theon as he, uh, or with Reek as he eventually sheds the Reek skin and regrows his, his Theon mind state. Um, so it, you know, there's, there's always hope for, for this type of thing like you do get to come back if you're out there and you're and you're you're depressed or worried about you know if you're struggling like there's hope you know so totally. if anybody's listening 
needs hope. There is hope. There's always hope. Yeah, you can come back. So that's an important lesson to learn. Yeah, like when you're at the very bottom, the only way to go is up. Yeah, and you can, you know? You can do it. Yeah, so that was awesome. Um, good to know that, that, that he does end up coming back and that these type of things are recoverable. Um, so, yeah, that pretty much wraps up uh, my number four. Anything else you want to add about that scene? No, no. It's and a good... w- was that your number three, you said? That was my number three, yes. So All what's right. Your- Three. My number three is Chupacabra. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the goat killer. Okay. <laughs> I dubbed this in my notes as Drogon's dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, the appetizer is warming up to, to get to children. You know, that's the next step from goats. Yes. <laughs> so uh, this is just a freaking epic moment as Drogon scares the shit out of this kid. And munches a, a fat, tasty little goat. And uh, it's so funny. Like It's an all-silent scene, and the kid's sitting there on the rocks, and he's watching the goats, and the dad's walking around. and He's sort of, bored as fuck. Yeah, he, the dad picks <laughs> up a goat and like pushes it in the right direction. And then the kid looks, he, he hears something faintly, you know, and looks down, and his eyes go wide, and Drogon just <laughs> rises up. Right from this like cliff face over the kid and that is one of the coolest shots of this whole show man yes and he kind of like screeches at him too and yeah. i'm like oh my God. <laughs> and his mouth is open and the kid just recoils and he's like crawling backwards as the shadow you know covers over him and and uh it, it, it's you know he roasts the goat and uh and flies off with one and it it's it's obviously foreshadowing the the next horrible step when he, when Drogon roasts the little girl, very sadly, yes, because the 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 goat herder and the father of the little girl approach Danny the same the way same with way. like a potato sack full of bones. Yep, and that's also yeah. one of the best performances on the show. That's like Alfie Allen level performance by that guy. Like it, oh, it brings father? tears to my eyes every oh, time. I can't even watch it. You know, every time it's yeah. It, beautifully acted it's yeah being that i have a two and a half year old (laughs) right and i don't and it still hits me super hard i can't even watch it it's like oh man yeah it's so brutal and uh it's it's interesting too we we get to see like the shadow rising over the kid and flying along and when i think with that when that guy's daughter gets roasted he says it was the the winged shadow um oh really yeah something like that so i'll have to watch for that yeah just a nice piece of prose there I try to like not pay attention to that scene. It's a great time to check my Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like go get a glass of water. So your eyes aren't <laughs> sore the rest of the evening. Yeah, it's like I know it's gonna. I know the scene. I've watched it before, so I don't. But for this rewatch, I'll pay attention. Cool. But, <laughs> so um, <laughs> I don't like it. Yeah, I don't blame you. It's it's rough. It's really rough. I love when shows are that powerful though that they can make you feel something that intensely. You know. That yeah, like you have to get well up done. and. It reminds me of, okay, so when I was a little kid and Jurassic Park came out, <laughs> I was he like us. seven. He left us. I was like seven or eight. I, I was for sure not older than eight. And I'm totally aging myself right now. But I watched it with my parents and I was so afraid. I did not want to watch it that anytime I started getting afraid, I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'm going to go get a glass of water. I'm going to go get a fruit roll up. I'm going to go uh, some snacks. And I kept like leaving diversion, the room. Diversion. And finally, my, my mom was like, are you, you know, is this too scary for you? And I was finally like, yes, <laughs> thank <laughs> you for asking. <laughs> it's hilarious. But it's like, I didn't want to like lose face in front of my parents. Like I wanted to act like I was brave. And this was kind of the first scary movie that they allowed me to watch. And I didn't want to like lose that privilege. So I was like trying really hard. But every time it got really scary, I just like would like run into the kitchen and go. How is it that uh, the food? Yeah, right. How is it that the the, the graphics in Jurassic Park 1 are like the best of all the Jurassic Parks? The practical effects, you know what I mean? Like, I remember when that came out, too, I was really young as well, like six or seven or something. Um, and I remember hearing stories of, like, old people, like, fainting in the movie theaters because it was oh, so really? terrifying. Oh. And I was like, wow, this movie sounds cool. I want to watch it, you know? 
nothing yeah, scares me. You and my husband are the same. Like he wasn't afraid at all. And I, I, I mean, it had a lasting impact on me. Like even when I watch it to this day, as I'm watching it, I remember the scenes that I used to get up and like leave the room. And the first time I watched it. Yeah. And it's even like, even when you're not seeing stuff, there's some really scary things. Like when uh, the main character is that little kid's like dinosaurs are stupid. You know, it's like, Oh, well this dinosaur would, you'd be distracted by the front and its partner would come in from the side and gut you like a fish with their yes, like five those, inch like, long hook and your, and your bowels would be pouring out and wrapping around your feet and you'd be tripping on them and bleeding. And the kid's like, ah, you know, <laughs> I know it's it's an intense movie when you're I'll I'll say I was seven I <laughs> around there when you're seven years old and you've never really watched something scary like that and I mean back twenty years ago that CGI was awesome. It wasn't CGI. It was uh, it was practical effects like all animatronics oh, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So I mean, it was so realistic, and it, yeah. I mean, to this day, it holds a candle. I mean. It's amazing. Yeah, that most movie. of it is most of it is practical. There's one moment where uh, the 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 girl she left or he left us he left us she's like in a vent and she like a, a oh, yeah. air conditioning thing and she like falls mm-hmm. through and is dangling and there was a stunt person and the stunt person like just reflexively like lifted their head towards the camera so they superimposed the girl's face onto her face. That's the only CGI I know of in the movie. I'm sure there's more. Oh, how funny. But uh, yeah, back to back to Game of Thrones. Yeah, sorry, total I keep, sidebar. <laughs> uh, I keep wondering when the guy brings in the bones, like how did he get the bones back? <laughs> you know, like did Drogon roast all those things and then just take one and just I'm left some burned stuff so, in the field? So, are we talking about the goat? Yeah, we're talking about the goat, not the girl. Yeah, yeah, but either way, like you know. Well, his line of fire, he. I think he roasted some other goats, but only picked up one of the goats. Yeah, probably. Yeah, that makes so, sense. So there might have been like leftover goats mm-hmm. to a crisp that Drogon didn't take. Yeah, that makes sense. Because he flew off with that one that was burning. Mm-hmm. But if when you so see badass. him go after that one goat, his his flames are. I mean, you don't see other goats get burned. They're very close to that line. So I'm thinking just out of being in the vicinity of the fire that they kind of got roasted because he said his flock. Yep. His flock, not just I lost a goat. He went there because he lost his flock. Right. So Danny's like, uh, she's like, tell this man I'm sorry for his hardship. You know, I can't bring back his goats, but I'll see that he's paid their value three times over. And she's like kind of smiling as the guy's like, oh, sweet, you know, cool, cool. And Danny's smiling and it's just like, it's foreshadowing her complete opposite reaction the next time mm-hmm. where there are no fucking smiles at all when she finds out that a little girl got killed. No, because you can't pay for the daughter three times. Over. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's not a fucking goat that you can just like pay for. Yeah. So um, not that goats aren't valuable. Like goats are kick ass, you know. But <laughs> there's it's funny uh, how the guy, he's like, he's all bowed over, but he like hurriedly like, steps backwards to get out of there in like a hurry like a rushed manner and it's just kind of funny the way that he does it it reminds me in of uh, in the tutors they always do that too like, yeah because they're nervous they're in front of a you know, always a very powerful person yeah, staying and bowed and retreating backwards while you're like still bowing and stuff. submission yeah it's pretty funny so that pretty much wraps up uh number three for me how about okay. your number two my number two i labeled the new small council Oh, right. Killer. Because we have some new new faces in the small council. Yeah, a couple. Being Oberyn. And then everybody's favorite, Mace Tyrell. The giant boob. <laughs> He's more of a boob than Robin Aaron? Is that possible? I think Mace Tyrell is Robin Aaron in 30 years. <laughs> maybe a few more than 30, <laughs> but yeah. 40, 50, maybe. Yes. Yeah, but... Um, I love that Mace is pissed that Oberyn is there because Oberyn's kind of making a joke about this. So he's like, so does this mean I'm the master of something now? Like the master in the master of ships and Mace is like, it's already been established that I'm the master of ships and he's all pompous and he thinks 
high and mighty because he's, you know, basically Tywin's pet dog. And this is echoed because does Tywin, Tywin asks him for wine or water. I can't remember if it was yeah, water or Yeah, for his, wine. his par- parchment and pen. Oh, that's right. Okay, that's right. His, yeah, his He's pay- like, yes, pen master. And he, like, as he gets up, he looks it over and, and turns his nose up at him, like... Yeah, like, oh, he's like asking that. me to do it, and Oberyn's cracking up, because he's like, I wouldn't go fucking get him a yeah, pen. Yeah, he's like, right, he's asking you to do it, you fucking bitch runner. Which is yeah. hilarious. So... But uh, Tywin enters at that moment when he's talking about, oh, it's already been established that I would be Master Ships, and everybody stands up except Oberyn, which is great. Yeah, it's just that little minimal, like... Disres- that there's still tension between the two of them. But- he's like, I'm not fucking standing up for this. But he's at the table. Mm-hmm. And I think that is, that speaks volumes. Oh, that- I just had another interesting thought too. Okay. Which is, um, Mace says that it's already established, you know, long before you were here that I would be master of ships. And uh, I was thinking maybe, right now it just came to mind, maybe in exchange for for convicting Tyrion, he would be named master of ships and put on the small council. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I like that theory because we know that. Yeah. Both of the new, both of the other judges are now all of a sudden on the small council, you know? Yes. And we knew that Oberyn was, that was part of his deal with Tywin. And we see that, well, technically, the deal was that Oberyn would help dispense justice to the killer. It wasn't that he would convict Tyrion. It was that he would, you know... And have a small uh, have a seat on the small council. Yeah. Because he wants to bring Dorne Right, yeah, that was part of the, the deal, is the small council thing. Yeah, Yeah. so, I mean, he, Tywin wasn't <clears throat> assuming that he would buy his vote, but he's, he took it as an opportunity to get Oberyn on the small council serve as a judge to get Dorne back into the fold. So it's a different motive than Mace Tyrell. I think Tywin knows that Mace will vote however Tywin tells him to because he just wants to be next to power. Right. So um, Tywin mentions that Sandor Clegane has been spotted in the Riverlands, the Hound, and he's killed five of their soldiers for Which some is fucking the chicken. end scene for where we, <laughs> where we got Needle back. Yep, so Varys says that his birds tell him that the Hound uh, killed five of their soldiers, and I believe the phrase, fuck the king, was uttered. And uh, I just <laughs> love the way that he says, fuck the king. It was so funny. But that yeah. means that we, he basically tells us that basically that innkeeper is one of Varys' bir- birds. You know, or the daughter. Who else was there? Yeah, one of the, you know, yeah. somebody there. So he's got birds everywhere, man. Varys is terrifying. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah, that was in my notes, too. And, you know, Tywin talks about the hound and he goes, you know, what, you know, what's the bounty on him? And they say, you know, it's 10 silver stags. And Tywin goes, make it 100. Like, oh, damn. You know, he's like. He doesn't even want to deal. He's just like, let's just get the hound back and he'll, right. you that know. slipped right past me. Yeah, because he goes, you know, what could we do to, you know, kind of promote getting the hound, like, you know, killed, essentially. Mm-hmm. They, well, you know, the current bounty is 10 silver stags and he goes, make it 100. Yeah, after which someone is says, quite a seems- jump. Seems like a generous bounty is bounty, and he's like, "Fuck it, make it a hundred. Like, yeah, we'll this guy like dead. we need to take care of this shit. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love Varys here. More whispers from the east, my lord. The Targaryen girl. Yes, and Tywin learns that she has conquered Marine and rules as its queen. That she has eight thousand unsullied. She has the cell swords, the second sons fighting for her. Mm-hmm. Two knights advising her, Sir Jorah Mormont and Sir Barristan Selmy, and three dragons. And this is where... Bad news. Cersei goes, baby dragons. Larger every year, your grace. Yes. And so, in this scene, we actually learn as a first-time viewer that Mormont is spying on Danny. Mm. From no longer, Town. though. No longer, though, but... But that we he are had unaware been. as a first-time viewer that Mormont was originally 
sent to spy on her. True, yeah, we it hasn't been like revealed to us yet. This is it. No, because like when he saves her from the wine merchant, we think of him as saving her life. Like he knows what's going on, but us as a first time viewer have no clue that Yeah, we just think he's really clever and like figured it out. Yeah, and you know, like when he tells her that he needs to go into the city to, you know, he has to do some work and she's like, I'll go with you. And he goes, no, 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 don't trouble yourself. Like, we know that he's going to send letters now, but at the time, you know, he could be going into the city for any reason. So I found that kind of interesting that this is the first, and it's very subtle. Like, Paisel just says it in passing. He goes, well, you know, Jorah Mormont was spying on her and goes, no, apparently he's like fully devoted Oh, yeah, now. he is. <laughs> He's fully devoted. <laughs> yeah, so I thought that that was really kind of a catch that as many times as I've watched this series, I realized in this rewatch that this is the first time we find out that Jorah is spying on Danny. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Cersei is just, like, flittingly dismissing this as a threat. She's like, baby... Yeah. And who fucking cares about this girl? It like, shows you how stupid Cersei is. Yeah. Like she's not smart. <laughs> we we see Oberyn again. He's such a cool character in the short amount of time that we have him on the show. And he goes, you know, again. He burns bright. I've seen the Unsullied. They are impressive on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. So not only has maybe he trained with him, like you kind of mentioned earlier, he's seen them fight on the battlefield on the battlefield yeah. that's, that's interesting. totally different than training so i thought mm-hmm. that was kind of a you know and <clears throat> you know the, basically the end the end of this story is she has to be dealt with yeah At that point she needs to be dealt with and we're either gonna battle with her or we're gonna take her out in a different way but she is becoming too powerful and this echoes back to last episode when she says, you know, I'm I'm going to stay here in Marine and rule. And I find it interesting that in this episode that Varys says, you know, she's conquered Marine. Okay, well, she's conquered three other cities, too. And Tywin didn't bat an eye. And like now ruling rules Marine as its queen. queen. Right, so how And cool. now she's a problem. Right, so maybe does he have a bird, like, even closer to Danny than we may know? Or does... I guess it's probably been publicly announced that she's like, I'm queen now, bitches. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that it's probably public, public knowledge, knowledge. Yeah. Oh, because, but. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say because, you know, Hisdar Zon Lorath. Hisdar Zalorak, yeah. Yeah, Hisdar Zalorak. He is calling her, you know, the queen. And so. Oh, yeah, she's holding court and everything. Yeah, everybody knows. I'm sure Varys has little birds in Marine that are aware that she's now ruling. She's not moving. She's taken up residence in the pyramid. Yep. And this scene, they also talk about um, Sir Barristan. Uh, someone says it would seem he took his dismissal from the Kingsguard a bit harder <laughs> than anticipated, which is funny. And Cersei's like poo-pooing it again. Like, he's an old man. He wasn't fit to protect my son. And... Tywin's like, Joffrey didn't die on his watch. Dismissing him was as insulting as it was stupid. You know, like, Cersei and it really was. Yeah, yeah, it really yeah. was. Because now, I mean, he's still, he might be old and maybe not as great or as quick of a fighter as he was before. But the knowledge in his head, like, that's what Varys was getting at. She has two seasoned knights <laughs> advising her. It's like, he doesn't say protecting her. Which yeah. they are, but they are advising her. They know Westeros. Yeah, they like know the Iron Throne. They know how it works. Barry's been around kings, you know. Like he's worked with a bunch <laughs> of kings, you know. Good old Barry, Barry the Bold, and uh, <laughs> yeah, craziness, man, danger Batman. in the East, big time. Yeah, Batman. Yeah, so that is my number two. It's a fairly short scene, but I always find that the sh- uh, the small council scenes are so important and and insightful into the politics of this show totally do you have any notes on this scene uh that pretty much covers all my notes as well i believe okay 
What is your number two? My number two was Davos, the master okay. of persuasion. Um, I can do my number one if you want, or you can do yeah. yours either way. No, let's see your number one first. Oh, actually, my number one was Varys and the Iron Throne, so we covered that. Oh shoot! Okay, as well already. <laughs> How about your number one? Um, my number one is the Confession. Nice. And I was gonna dub Tyrion's whole scene as my number one, but I decided to focus solely on Peter Dinklage's probably arguably one of his best acting moments on the entire series. Yeah, you could say that. <laughs> which is his confession to his father about not killing Joffrey, but for being a dwarf. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I, you know, I saved you, I saved the city and all your worthless lives. I should have let Stannis kill you all. And the Reigns of Castamere are playing, by the way, in the background. Oh, yeah. I noticed they played in the credits, too, but I didn't realize at this point they're playing. Yeah, it's it's not. It's a different kind of set of Reigns of Castamere. It's much darker and slower. Mm -hmm. He goes, I'm guilty for being a dwarf. You're not on trial for being a dwarf. I've been on trial for that my entire life. <laughs> and I love... I love Peter Dinklage in this scene because he is a dwarf in real right. life. And I'm sure he has faced this, you know, kind of trial in his own personal life. If not, if not the trial, there's got to be like some pent up angst, you know, I imagine. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't imagine kind of the, Probably the bullying and the looks and the teasing and the snickers and the stares that he got before he was famous, just like many people that go through, you know, that have disabilities or deformities. It's it's sad and it happens and it's sad. So I really feel that we see Tyrion. I mean, this is who the character is, but we also see true raw emotion in this moment with Peter mm -hmm. Dinklage. I'm Definitely. guilty of being a dwarf. I've been on trial for this my entire fucking life. And you can see it in his face, like the anger that comes out. That's not acting. I mean, it's he's acting, but it's not acting. It's so intense. And yeah, one of the best performances of the series, no doubt. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And you know, he goes, I did not do it. And he looks at <laughs> yeah. Cersei and he goes, I did not kill Joffrey. And but I wish that I had. <laughs> watching your vicious bastard die gave me more relief than a thousand lying whores. <laughs> <laughs> I and wish I, I was the monster you think I am. <laughs> I know. I, I will not give my life for Joffrey's murder. And I know I'll get no justice here, so I will let the gods decide my fate. I demand a trial by combat. And the yeah. look on Tywin's face is like, you mother fucker. Yep, he, he totally misread what Tyrion would do. He thought that Tyrion would beg for forgiveness and everything. And the, the, the stare down between these two oh that's going on. Oh my god, on, it's like it's the like, old uh, west. Yeah, it's like that, or it's like um, like on like if you're watching like Superman or something, and there's like one bad guy with laser vision and one good guy with laser vision, and they're like they both shoot their laser vision at each other, and it like meets in the middle, and it's like zzz, like going back and forth, you know? Yeah, and oh man, you know, Tyrion knows he has the ace up his sleeve here because Jamie has divulged that if you go take the black, you know, you have to plead guilty, but you can go take the black. Your life will be spared. I have to give up my oath as a king's guard and go back to Casterly Rock. And basically, I'm willing to do that for you to save your life. Mm -hmm. But, and I love Jamie's face when Tyrion... When Tyrion it looks like died. his dog just died. He's just like, oh my God. But 
from Tyrion's perspective, he has the ace up his sleeve because clearly he just said, I'm a dwarf. I'm demanding a trial by combat. The odds of him surviving a trial by combat, fighting himself, are very slim to none. So he's wiping out Tywin's legacy with one swoop, essentially. Oh, that's pretty funny. That he dies in combat. And Jamie doesn't have to live up to his Jamie half of the deal. Jamie doesn't have to live up to his half of the deal because Tyrion's not taking the black. So he remains, you know, bound to his oath as a king's guard and cannot father children named Lannister. Yeah, that was an important moment too. Like when when uh, Tywin says that, um, like you will na- you will father children named Lannister. Like that's mm-hmm. telling us that he fucking knows the truth. Like he's been denying it for a while before, but he tells Jamie like I fucking know those are your kids, you motherfucker. You're gonna have some Lannister kids, you son of a bitch. You know. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, it's um, it's a great. It's a great moment for Peter Dinklage. His acting is un it's unbelievable. It's incredible. And it's also a, a major turning point for Tywin because when Jamie goes in, Jamie thinks that he's offering Tywin the solution. Like, I'm gonna sacrifice another oath, which you've in previous scenes we know that. He's told his father he does not want to sacrifice another oath break. Right. So he goes to Tywin and he's like, look, if you let Tyrion live, I will relinquish my honor (laughs) as Kingsguard. And Tywin goes, fine, great. He just know he just goes done. Yeah, because it's already a part of Tywin's plan. Right, and I wasn't sure if Tywin had suspected that Jamie would say this and already was like planning on agreeing, or whether it was like, like a, a, a seize the moment type thing where he already had the plan to let Tyrion live, and then when T- when Jamie makes this offer, he's just like 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 Capitalizes grabs it as it. as quickly as he can, like done, done, done. You know, like we'll do it. <laughs> I think. I think, and this is speculation to uh, to a degree, is Tywin knows how much Jamie loves his brother. Oh yeah, he's protected him his entire life. So he may have I, sort of been anticipating it. He was anticipating that Jamie, knowing that this trial is a scam, it's a farce, it's fucking stupid, that Jamie would do something drastic to save his brother's life, and the only thing. That Jamie knows that Tywin wants of Jamie is for him to be his heir. Yep. And continue He's like, to like I'll do it. I'll give you what you want. I'll you know I'll, I'll forsake my honor and my soul basically and my yeah. love for Cersei because I know but I'll be far away from her. This scene we find out that Jamie loves Tyrion more than Cersei. Absolutely, and is protective of honestly the family legacy because he's yeah. both and he's. T- you know, reasoning with his father, like, you're going to kill off your heir. Like, I know you don't love him. I know you think he's a pain in the ass to you, but like, you've been about family our whole lives, a dynasty to last a thousand years, and you're about to fucking destroy your dynasty. Yeah, because, you know, so Tywin is smart enough to know that Jamie is willing to sacrifice what I would consider, you know, it's an oath nonetheless, but it's not one that is necessarily like frowned upon as far as like if the king releases you from the king's guard it's not dishonorable well i mean it's interesting because i think barristan was the first one to be released oh okay so it doesn't happen that often yeah and i think that it was perceived as being like like a dishonor to barristan you know what i mean like a dishonorable discharge (laughs) kind like yeah well it was like um yeah yeah kind of (laughs) yeah under the guise of like, yeah, it's okay, we'll accept your resignation, but really, it's like, yeah, you're like, it's like, it's a dishonor, you know? Yeah. So I, you know, I love Jamie's sentiment here. He goes, "I saved the Mad King ordered me to bring you your head, or right. bring him your head. I saved your life so you could murder my brother." Yeah. Like <laughs> what the fuck? So, so good. You know, Jamie is thinking, like, I have this great solution. Like, I know what Tywin wants. If you, I know that the only way to save Tyrion's life is he has to take the black. And 
Tywin's already thought all this out because he doesn't necessarily want to see Tyrion die. And we know this because he wanted to throw him into the sea, but he didn't as a child. Right. As a baby. But the best scenario for Tywin is to send Tyrion to the wall. Mm -hmm. Because he's out of his hair. And also then he doesn't have to be like a kin slayer, you know, per se. Exactly. He's out of sight, out of mind, but still relinquished all titles and alive. Yeah, but still alive. Mm -hmm. And so Jamie, when Tywin says done, Jamie, his face, he instantly knows like, oh that God, this I've was a part of your plan all, all along. All along. Yeah, he sets him up he too. He's like, fuck. Um, Jamie says, well, you know, well, what happens to your name? Who carries the lion banner into future battles? Your nephews? Lancel Lannister? Lancel? <laughs> Other names? Others whose names I don't even remember? And Tywin switches on it, switches on, what happens to my dynasty if I spare the life of my grandson's killer? You know, and that's that's where it like spurs Jamie to say like, well, it survives through me because I'll like forsake my vows, you know, to to save him. Yeah. Tyrion just like set or Tywin just set him up perfectly, and then just bam, snares him. It shows you Done. how how good Tywin is at the game. He's so good. He's maybe the best player of the game that we've uh, encountered. Yes. So I mean, that's pretty much my what i constituted as kind of my number one i mean the whole trial was super important yeah, I have we'll get more into that later it. yeah yeah but that's I, I mean that was my number one for sure nice i just want to add something about the end there um so <laughs> i demand a trial by combat and then it cuts to everybody's reactions and Mar marjorie looks shocked shay looks terrified obrin yes. Ob <laughs> obrin looks like he's already wanting to volunteer Excited, yes. probably knowing that Cersei's going to choose the mountain as her champion. Jamie, you? <laughs> yeah, Jamie looks like his dog just died. You know, like he, just, <laughs> like he just like he's just like broken Fuck. over this. You know, <laughs> and Cersei looks a little nervous and super fucking mad. And then the the stare down between Tywin and Tyrion. If it's looks could chilling. kill, man, it's yes. yeah. Like this may be the most intense stare down in in cinematic history like i can't think it's of anything intense that, it's pretty chilling compares. yeah after everything like, leading to this moment and like like I, it's i think it's the most intense stare down ever like on screen because i love it because it's Tyrion's like what are you gonna do about it dad and his dad's like motherfucker yeah and they just both look like they want to kill each other which they do yeah like, but so. only one will survive <laughs> we know who that is <laughs> yep <laughs> surprisingly enough <laughs> yeah oh yeah so that's great i love that scene um that that pretty much uh wraps up all of our notes right shall we get our our, uh, our top fives shall we jump into notes yes let's jump into notes all right so first on my notes is uh danny meeting his uh, his dar zolorak for the first time yes this this is my first on my notes too nice <laughs> So uh, send the next one in after the uh, the goat herder guy leaves, and it's her future husband. You know, tales of your beauty were not exaggerated. And she's like, "Fucking <laughs> thank you." Yeah. <laughs> um, and she kind of doesn't understand what's going on at first. Uh, My father was m m one of Marine's most respected and beloved citizens. He oversaw the restoration and maintenance of the greatest landmarks, including this pyramid. And she's like, oh, that's fucking rad. I'd, I'd love to meet him. You know, he sounds cool. And he's like, ah, well, you fucking crucified him. And she, <laughs> and she like, Ew. sort of shudders in reaction. Like, she's visibly shaken by that, you know. And it's further revealed that he spoke out against crucifying the children. So she wasn't sh very discriminate, like dis discriminate. She was very indiscriminate with who she picked to crucify, basically. Because if she like had <clears throat> investigated each of them and learned their motivations and stuff, this guy probably wouldn't have been crucified since he had spoken out against the crime that she's punishing him for. Um, so it's interesting, and uh, he, he, he uh, his dar has a great line. Well, it has a line which Danny meets with a great line. He's like, he he decried it as a criminal act, but was overruled. 
is it justice to answer one crime with another? And this is Danny's thug, thug life moment, you know. I'm so sorry that you no longer have a father, but my treatment of the masters was no crime. You'd be wise to remember that. Yes. You know, and then... Da-da-da-da. The blunt and the glasses come down. And uh, it, was, it was just a gangster moment. And, uh, you know, what's done is done. He replies, you're the queen and I'm a servant of Marine." So he begs her to reinstate the tradition of funeral rite, rites and proper burials and everything. And um, she actually obliges him and lets him, you know, bury his father, which is, it's, uh, you know, she's trying to do the right thing, you know. I think she realizes she kind of fucked up <laughs> in the way she handled. I think she realizes that she might have been too quick to pull the trigger. Yeah. That maybe she should have. You, you know, because Barristan advises her, you know... Against it. To, you know, sometimes the best way to deal with injustice is with mercy. Yep. And she goes, I will answer justice with justice. And while I completely 100% agree with her, I think she was hasty. Right. And just and so she called 163 it, people. You right. Know, versus weeding through and learning the politics of Marine. And picking out the actual people that were a part of what she was crucifying them right. for. Right. So Barristan quest knows what she's going to do and questions it. And she says, you know, for, like, I understand what you're saying, but this is justice. And then his dar here questions whether or not it was justice at all. And then that makes her mad, you know, because she's probably, like, thinking, fuck, you know, I kind of fucked up. And then, um, you know, she, she it's a whole learning process for her. But I really do think she's, like, trying to do her best to be a just ruler and, uh, I do too. You know, so that's cool. And then yeah, we find yeah. out that there's 212 more supplicants waiting. And she's like, 212 more of these. <laughs> yes, your grace. <laughs> Send the next she's one like, in. And oh she's, my God. she's going, you know, she's she's doing the, the, the legwork to uh, to be a ruler. She's, she's sitting there on that hard-ass bench, hurting her precious beautiful little booty and yeah and uh at some point barristan i think has some pillows made for her which is pretty funny oh really yeah (laughs) at least is that like a true thing yeah yeah in the books we get more details like her butt's all sore and everything and barristan has nice pillows made for her but she's doing it you know like she's she's going through like the the uncomfortable and not fun aspects of ruling that are necessary for a good ruler stuff that robert baratheon wouldn't put up with you know he went to one small council meeting in in 17 years but here danny is meeting with 212 supplicants you know potentially in one day if she can get through them all so and she's realizing in this moment too that ruling is much more difficult than expected like she's been conquering it's one thing to like have now she's got to like deal with these people yeah, dealing with people with their problems and, you know, disagreements with maybe how she's doing things is mm-hmm. probably exhausting for her. And she's also realizing in meeting Hisdar that she needs to figure out the traditions of Marine. Right. If you're going to rule people, if you're a foreign leader coming in to rule a, a population of people, it might be wise <laughs> to learn their traditions and you may not agree with them and you may look to change them, as, but knowing them is important. And his dar is a huge lesson to Danny. Right. He keep, keeps pushing the traditions. Like we want the fighting pits back in action, etc. And this was sort of foreshadowed by Dario Naharis, who saw this all coming basically when he's saying like, you need to learn the lay of the land. He brings you the broader, the three types of flowers, flowers and explained like the purposes of everything. And that's sort of like, um, it's the first seed planted for like this next step of the process which is learning the like the beyond the plants learning the traditions and the customs and the way that everything works so that she can rule effectively and justly and be loved so yeah and realizing the masters that she was so quick to crucify yeah there's more than meets the eye (laughs) yeah they may have served her like his father (laughs) i mean 
he shared the same sentiment she did. Right. Some of them may have been good people. She could have utilized their advice and counsel into ruling this great city. So I think she's realizing very quickly that blind, blind justice is not the answer. Maybe calculated justice is in, in exerting some patience. Yeah, this is the CIA. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. I was just going to say in in the moment of her crucifying those ma masters, she's proving a point. Totally. And the CIA has a book about this <laughs> called Blowback, um, oh, okay. which, you know, you do, you make moves in places and there are unforeseen consequences. And I think it's pretty safe to say that this initial slaying of 162 noblemen of Marine uh, results in the, uh, the militarization of the Sons of the Harpy. Yes. So I that would be that. the blowback from this uh, sort of thoughtless, um, you know, justice or, or what Danny thinks is justice. It has ends up having major blowback, you know, so you got to be real careful with this type of shit. Yeah, because the Sons of the Harpy, even though they have the masks. So I was looking at his Dar's outfit with like the rings and the, the ties and the robes and the green, uh, the blue and the yellow the sons of the harpy have those kind of same rings and same wardrobe as the as the masters did in Marie. nice whereas the common people i'll call them like the freed slaves they're in they're in brown and tan mm -hmm. the sons of the harpy mirror exactly what the masters are wearing which are colorful garbs with True. these rings with the um like scarves kind of they're, i think they're called tow cars Okay, Tokar's like braided through the through the ring. So that indicates to me that the sons of the harpy are the masters. Yeah, definitely. Good point. Good catch. Anything else you want to add about uh, this scene? No, that was it for me. All right, let's move on. My next notes are about um, basically leading into the trial scene. Is there anything else you wanted to cover before we get to the trial? No, the only thing I have left here is about a half a page of notes on the trial. <laughs> cool. So Jamie visits Tyrion, and this time he's wearing full Kingsguard armor, which is not a good sign. You know, and Tyrion is joking with him. Let me guess, I've been pardoned. You know, <laughs> nope, you're getting handcuffed. Really? Father's orders, you know. Uh, and we mustn't disappoint father. So then... Uh, Tyrion's getting led into the trial room, the throne room, and people are shouting at him, Kingslayer, and everything. And, and he glares at them, and yeah. I love that look. He's like, don't call me that. And then Tommen, you know, recuses himself from being a judge in the trial, and I'm wondering why. You know, like, you recuse yourself if there's, like, a conflict of interest or something like that, and you could be seen as being partial. But fucking, <laughs> it makes more sense for Tywin or Cersei to recuse themselves. They have more direct and close relationships with Tyrion than than Tommen does. So what gives? I think I think we we know that Tommen's very malleable. Oh yeah, I mean obviously it's he's, he's being manipulated by you know Tywin. Tywin, yeah. But I don't think he just knows better. I don't even think he realizes he what the, the word recuse means. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> He wouldn't know what to do in this situation. He's not ready yet to be handling no, this. No, and I do want to backpedal just for one moment sure. of when they lock Tyrion into the little box. Mm. It's all like very. This is, I mean, this is a sham trial. We know that, so I feel like Tywin is making his son, who we know is a dwarf, and the likelihood of him like battling his way out of there if he wasn't locked in this box right just adding insult to injury yeah it's all kind of for show he's this big horrible monster exactly and it's like he has to be locked in this box it's like dude he's he's like, like really i didn't do it and, and i couldn't you know, i can't escape he's anyway like <laughs> just sitting there like not i mean he's not like angry or thrashing about so he's not trying to run <laughs> yeah so i think you know that's where Jamie and uh, Tyrion's conversation comes from. He's like, seriously, oh, you're going to put ridiculous. me in chains. Like, I'm not going to freaking try to get out of here. Like I'm I got the dwarf. shortest <laughs> legs here. I couldn't escape if I tried. Yeah. So I just, 
I found that very, you know, insightful on how how this is such a it's like total, reality TV. total show. It's, yeah, it's a total yeah, reality show TV. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Yeah. yeah. So that's pretty funny. And then um, so so uh, Prince Oberyn and Lord Mace of House Tyrell get called up to uh, to be judges. And I'm like, oh, great. Mace, he'll do whatever he's told. No doubt. You know. <laughs> And then this is interesting. We talked about the uh, there's a lot of synchronized si- sitting in this episode. That was almost one of my top five, but I thought it was like too much of a joke to you know, list as my top five. We get the three bankers at the Iron Bank all sitting and like synchronized with each other. We get Oberyn, Tywin, and uh, Mace all sitting synchronized with each other, mirroring that. And then it cuts to the the peanut gallery, and everybody in the peanut gallery sits at the same moment too. So there's a lot of people sitting synchronized. You know, instead of synchronized swimming, it's synchronized sitting. Which <laughs> totally. Is, I just thought that was kind of funny. Yeah. And we, this is the first time we see Tywin sit physically in the Iron Throne, too. Oh, nice. Which I loved because we've seen him next to it. We've yeah. seen him looming over it. But we've he really, him. he's really been sitting there the whole time, you know, just exactly. without actually ever doing it. So this is, he's physically sitting in the, the chair. The curtain is, is, pulled back Mm -hmm. and we see who really sits the iron throne in this scene yeah it's fucking awesome good call i like that that's so cool so uh, you know they chain him up and uh, it starts off really fucking direct Tyrion of the house lannister you stand accused by the queen regent of regicide did you kill king joffrey no (laughs) you know did your wife the lady sansa not that i know that i know of (laughs) How would you say he died then? Choked on his pigeon pie. pie. (laughs) So would you blame the bakers? (laughs) Or the pigeons? Just leave me out of it. (laughs) Fucking hilarious line. So good. So then the first witness is called and it's Marin fucking Trent. And he's talking like a tattling little biznatch. Like he's like a third grader just narking out somebody for like breaking the rules in the playground, you know. Once we had Joffrey safely away from the mob, the, king, the imp rounded on him. He slapped the king across the face and called him a vicious, a vicious idiot, idiot and a fool. <laughs> you know, and he goes through the whole thing and called our king a halfwit, compared his grace to the mad king. And when I spoke out in the king's defense, <laughs> he threatened to have me killed. You know, he's just he's fucking. Like, oh, why don't you tell him what you were fucking doing? You were freaking beating a helpless girl with a sword and ripping her clothes off yeah first, you know it's pointing like pointing a loaded crossbow at her yeah i love that he kind of stood up in that you yeah know, same and, here although it had the unfortunate side effect of making him look look unruly and uncontrollable um, yes. which, which worked against him but that was yeah i liked how he and stood up for sansa stark. there yeah 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 exactly De- also defending a stark which plays into what varies says exactly. later about yeah i have that in my notes of he defends a Stark and then Varys kind of says, like, perhaps, you know, being married to Sansa, you know, made Tyrion more sympathetic, sympathetic to their to cause. Sympathetic to the northern cause. And I was like, what the fuck, um, Varys? Like, you're, you're, you know, saying more than you need to. You know what I mean? Like, you're really kind of throwing him under the bus here. Yeah, I agree with that. But Varys also explicitly outright told Tyrion, I'm not going to lie for you. Right. And everything. But he, like, there's a difference between not lying and, like, divulging every detail. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree with that, too. Like, it's, he knows he didn't do it, but he's still up there claiming that, like, he oh, maybe he's sympathetic to, say, to the Northern cause. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't need to say, like, being sympathetic, but he's also a lot of the things that he said were, were fact, you know? Yeah, and true. No, yeah, definitely. I also do think... He needs to make know, himself look credible as a witness, too, so he doesn't get, like beaten with Tywin's hose later or something. Yeah, but I also think in a, in a weird way, while it's it's skepticism when he says, like, perhaps being married to Sansa made him more sympathetic to their cause, in reality, that's actually kind of true. Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. so it's it like, he, it could have been omitted. It didn't need to be said by it Varys. Just, Varys just knows that he didn't do it. You yeah. know, but by saying that, it makes Tyrion look more guilty when he knows he's not exactly. guilty. You know what I mean? So it's exactly. like, why would you say that? You know he's not guilty. Why are you making him look guilty? Like, you you yeah. have respect for this guy, you know? Like, 
I just found I it know. unnecessary, you know, but I agree. He has to make himself, you know, he's he's playing his part, you know. Have you forgotten me, Lord Varys? <laughs> yeah, that was so brutal, man. Like, yeah, I just have one question, Father, if possible. You know, you once said that I saved the city, that, <laughs> that, uh, et cetera. Like, you, you, so you said no matter what happened, you know, the history books will forget me, but you'll never forget, you know, have you forgotten me? And it's just fucking heartbreaking, man. Like, Tyrion. And I love what he says. He goes, sadly, my lord, I never forget a thing. Yeah. And I that was like a veiled apology. Yeah, totally a veiled apology, and also it, it like we were talking about how he was cut when he was a young kid. Mm-hmm. Like he remembers that shit in detail too, as we know, and it haunts him. So yes. it's it's pretty. It seems pretty accurate. Like I bet she, I bet he wishes he could forget that, but sadly he he still remembers it. <laughs> you know. Which yeah. Is so I I did like that because he does give him like a look of sympathy. Like I. Of course, I did not forget that I said that, but I also didn't forget that I told you flat out, I'm not going to lie for you. Right. You know? Yeah, it's yeah, it's brutal. He's always in you know shitty positions like this. Like he couldn't help Ned Stark either. Same type deal, even though he yeah. respected Ned as well. So next up is um, is oh, and and Marin Trant gives Tyrion like a glare, like hey, hey, you fucker, as he's walking out after his testimony. And next up is Pycelle. Pycelle. <laughs> who's Listing off all the fucking the poisons, <laughs> like like uh, like uh, Lady Lisa. I was just, I thought about Lady Lisa when he was reading <laughs> off all the poisons. It's like basilisk this is awesome. venom. Yeah, it's like it's like Napoleon Dynamite with his skills. He's like basilisk venom, widow's blood, <laughs> wolfsbane skills, essence of nightshade skills. You know, going through all the skills and poisons. You've made your point, Grand Master, <laughs> and uh, uh, you have a lot of fucking poison. Had, Prince Oberyn, my stores were plundered. By whom? By the accused, Tyrion Lannister, after he had me wrongfully imprisoned. And he fucking hates <laughs> Tyrion after that shit. He cut his beard, too. I don't... I know we men- I mentioned this at the time on the podcast when it happened, but um, Pycelle had, like, this illustrious beard, which made him look, like, grand and, like, magnificent. It was, like, a, a, it was a crowning achievement was, you know, obviously being... A long beard. High yeah. septon, but all this beard is, like... The fucking wizard beard, you know, and after Tyrion cuts it off or has the uh, that that clansman, that hill tribesman cut it off <laughs> with an axe or whatever, it never like grows back. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you can't yeah. grow it anymore. So his like his distinguishment has like it's like a big blow to his ego and, and his uh, persona. So he really is pissed at Tyrion for that. And he's used like this is his chance to get back at him, you know? Yes. And I was surprised. I forgot he he ends up pulling out the necklace, you know. And uh, there we found residue of the most horrible poison of all, the strangler, which you know was used to kill Joffrey. And I'm thinking, Baelish, you son of a bitch, like you. So yes, I have this in my notes. Yeah. Did, so he threw that necklace on Adontos's body. Right. Is that a plant or was that just? That was the necklace. He like that was like not so much a plant, but he left it there on purpose to be discovered. Okay, and that pisses what... me off because this is like something that solidifies making Sansa look guilty. So he's set up Sansa here even more than he had to. Um, yes, he could have easily torched that fucking boat or dumped Dantos and the fucking necklace into the Blackwater Bay. Instead, he made sure that that they were sitting there floating, waiting to be found. You exactly. know, which is that's what I thought too. That it's on purpose. That it wasn't just a oversight of right. Littlefinger just tossing it, thinking that he was throwing it into the water, and it landed on Dantos's nope. body. Yeah, I don't think so. Fucking I don't think so bastard, either. dude. Bastard. Yeah. Littlefinger is such a scumbag. He is such a scumbag. So, um, you know, that whole thing happens, and he goes through how Sansa was wearing the necklace on the wedding day, and and everything, and. And he has uh, the funniest line, like the whole fucking show, the funniest thing. The Strangler, a poison few in the Seven Kingdoms possess and used to strike down the most noble (laughs) child the gods ever put on this good earth. And And Q over and rolling his eyes. Rolling his eyes, yeah. And pretty much anybody that ever knew Joffrey has to be rolling their eyes. Like, I'm just like, wow, Pycelle, shill much. They even (laughs) pan over to Jamie, and even Jamie's face is like. (laughs) 
yeah. uh, that's like enough. wow, yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> like that is the most hardcore shilling. He's just ass kissing Cersei in that line. I mean, oh, yeah, because we know that his loyalties lie with Cersei. With Lannister, always oh, Lannister. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, then it cuts to Cersei on the stand, and she's quoting Tyrion, you know, saying, He said, I will hurt you for this. A day will come when you think you are safe and happy, and your joy will turn to ashes in your mouth, and you will know the debt is paid. And uh, Mace is like, your own brother said this to you? Like, damn, bitch, that's fucked up. And uh, they go through the whole story. But Oberyn is like the only one that really asks questions. Yeah, like real questions. Like real, like what debt is he talking to you uh-huh. about? Like, yeah, yeah. What's I know the about debt? This. It's like, not like why was he pissed at you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like Mace is like, oh, how horrifying, you know. And it's just like check another box in the guilty, you know, right, column. Right. And then but yeah, Oberyn's, Oberyn's like, like, well, why, you know, why did he like what debt are is he talking about? And Cersei's like, well, I found out that he had been keeping whores in the Tower of the Hand. He wasn't pleased. So yeah, I asked him to confine his to confine his salacious behavior to the brothel, and to it's total bullshit. Total bull, bullshit. Total bullshit. So I have write, write, written down in my notes: first lying whore. LOL. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Cersei's the first lying whore to take the stand. <laughs> yeah, I do have a note before we move on. Sure. I that Marjorie is sitting up where all of like the. I want to dub them kind of like the royal family. Mm. Is thing. So, oh, is so that must be arranged at this point. Yeah, then. is she already betrothed to Tommen? She would technically point? be a dowager queen, I think, as well at this point, considering she had just been married and her king oh, had died. Oh, okay. Even though he wasn't, even though it wasn't consummated. Yeah, potentially, it's like right in the middle. So they maybe can, since they're they're already planning on like keeping her in the fold anyway and she was already yeah. married to one king maybe just to keep up appearances you know like they're keeping okay. her up there or that's something what i like thought that. too because loris is up there too but we know that cersei has agreed to marry loris in a fortnight so right, I, right. Figured, I knew why loris was up there but marjorie was kind of like is she betrothed to tom oh yeah because they were they were going to give tom uh marjorie a couple week a fortnight as well to to uh, mourn and they've planned her wedding now as well and then two weeks a fortnight after that then Loras and Cersei are getting hitched, so. Yeah, so I just found it kind of interesting that the Tyrells were up there, and I yeah. figured it was And she has like interesting that. reactions the, throughout the whole thing. Like, when she sees the necklace that Sansa was wearing, because Olena has already confessed to her, so she knows that Olena yeah. was involved, but now she's learning, like, more depth to what happened. Like, wow, like, Olena planted this necklace on, on Sansa? Like, holy shit, like, this is So she had kind crazy. of befriended Right, like, yeah, like, Olena had specifically, like, brought in Sansa and had her confess about what a monster Joffrey was, and then Sans- and then Olena participates in setting her up to take the fall for Joffrey's murder, like... And I love her reactions when the witnesses are talking, because she knows the truth. She knows right. she was involved she, in that. Yeah, and Olena tells her straight up, Tyrion had nothing to do with it, you know, so she's yeah. just watching in horror, basically, this whole time as this that innocent this is man. all a lie. Yeah, yes. it's being persecuted and prosecuted. And she can't say a thing, you know, because if yeah. she... And she's pretty careful about her facial expressions. She does shocked more than anything, but mm-hmm. she does shock. We know, just though. As well as, yeah, we know. <laughs> she knows that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we know, she knows, that Tyrion knows he didn't do it, and that these that people Elena on knows. the stand know <laughs> that they didn't do it, and they're all lying, and... Everybody knows, but no one knows. Yeah, <laughs> you so, know nothing. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's when Varys gets excused, and they uh, they take a break, and that's when Jamie confronts Tywin. And it's funny, um, Jamie is fucking pissed, and he like storms across the room and goes straight for Tywin. Doesn't even look at Tyrion because he's just so mad. You can tell he doesn't and, even look at Cersei either because he knows that she's behind all this bullshit. Yeah, and 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 so he goes to see Tywin. And he's like, this, is, this isn't a trial. This is a farce. Cersei's manipulated everything and you know it. And, and T- Tywin's like, I know nothing of this sort. And he's like, you always hated Tyrion. And Tywin says, he killed his king. And Jamie says, as did so I. So did I. <laughs> you know? And I was like, damn, that is a poignant line. Like, wow. 
And that's when he says, you know, the last order the Mad King gave me to bring him your fucking head. So what did I, I, I saved you so you could kill my brother, you know, and we already covered all that, but just a really intense moment. And it's, it's a very important moment between Jamie and his father. Yeah. And sure. we see how much Jamie like really does love his brother and what he's willing to sacrifice to save him. And it, like he sacrifices everything, everything to save Tyrion here. Like it's, it's really powerful. Um, what Jamie does here. I, it's a big moment in his redemption for sure. Oh, absolutely. He's, he has arrived yeah. from a redemption standpoint here. Yeah. He's, he's definitely, you know, making big progress <laughs> for sure. So, uh, they end up coming back and, <laughs> and Jamie goes up to Tyrion before everybody, while everybody's getting settled. And he's like, uh, he's like, listen, you're gonna be found guilty, you know. And he's like, "Oh, you you think so, Jamie?" Like, obviously, he's like, uh. "No, no, 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 I know." Like, but when you are, you need to enter a formal plea for mercy and ask to be sent to the wall. Father has agreed to it. He'll spare your life and allow you to join the Night's Watch. He's like, "Well, uh, Ned Stark was promised the same thing, and fucking, you know, we know we know how that turned out." It's like, "Father's not Joffrey. He'll keep his word." Well, well how do you know? And this is another powerful moment between two brothers, you know, and he kind of pauses and they like they're making eye contact do you trust me you know yes and it, <laughs> it, it reminded me of uh aladdin you know like do you trust <laughs> me you know <laughs> come on like magic carpet ride you know uh and then it and yeah but <laughs> i so, just wanted to start singing a whole new world when you just said yeah. that <laughs> it's, Aladdin's funny too because he's like trust me trust me and then the genie's like just tell her the truth and he's like no fucking way I'm not telling her the truth <laughs> so Aladdin's full of shit and then he ends up getting everything he wants anyway uh, which is great but a uh, very powerful brotherly moment very heartbreaking you know uh, like it's it's beautiful and sad all at once um, keep your mouth shut no more outbursts this will all be over soon you know, and then the, the the crown calls its next witness, and it's fucking Shay, dude. Uh, and everybody like turns and hear you hear footsteps, and Tyrion is sort of surprised that someone is coming in who's not already there. I think, and he turns and sees her, and he has this look on his face. It's a moment of shock and panic all at once, and sadness too. He's yeah. Like, what? Like, yeah, I mean, because totally. in his mind, she's gone. Right. And then all of a sudden, like, he's shocked to see her back. He's saddened to see her. He's panicking because she, you know, like, is in a position to fuck him over big time. And, uh, yeah. It's so do you fucked. think Shay left and was retrieved, or do you think she never left at all? And I been don't think she ever left. Hand? Yeah, she probably never left. And this is my question. Like, obviously, most of this has been rigged by Cersei. Um, but... I think Tywin is involved with rigging this as well because she he had her summoned to his tower after finding out that she was, you know, at the wedding. Cersei pointed her out, mm -hmm. I think it was. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me, like, what do you think? Do you think that Cersei compromised I Shay? Or do you think it's Bron Tywin? I wonder if Bronn got paid. Well, Bronn, as we find out, is being given a lordship and a castle for something by Cersei. Remember, he, he divulges that to Tyrion. He's like, I can't be your champion. Like, I'll pro probably die and they're offering me a castle. So, you know, I kind of want think, that fun castle. I think he, whether it was Cersei or Tywin or the both of them paid Bronn to tell Tyrion and lie to him and say Shay was on that ship, but she's been in the Tower of the Hand the whole time. Probably. So when, fucked up, man. When Tyrion finds her in bed, she is extremely comfortable. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, what's, you know, my, oh, my lion. lion. Yeah. Like, it's not the first time that she's said that. So yeah. I think T Tywin has had her this whole time. Oh, wow, yeah. And it's even worse when she says that, too, because this in this scene, she says, he made me call him his li uh, my lion, you know, like, and he's like, oh, my God. So fucking brutal. So she swears in. She know says she knows him because he was his hand uh, Sansa's handmaiden. And, and uh, again, Oberyn asks a question here. He goes, why would... Yeah, because she says, I know he's guilty. He and Sansa planned it together. And Oberyn's like, well, how would you know this? How would you know this? Like, why would your, you know, hand, why would, you know, the handmaiden know all this stuff? And he, and then that's when we learn, like, oh, well, I was also, I'm also a whore. <laughs> I'm also his whore, yeah. I'm a whore. 
I'm a, a funny whore. No, you're the annoying whore, as you said, Rachel. <laughs> More like an annoying whore. <laughs> That was one of my favorite moments of that podcast. She is an annoying whore. <laughs> uh, totally. So uh, she's making up all this bullshit. Uh, he and Sansa planned it together. She wanted revenge for her father, her mother. Tyrion wanted to fuck her, but she wouldn't let him in his bed. So he agreed to kill Joffrey in order to get in her bed, basically. Which is quite a believable story. Right. That's what I've written down. It's all very convincing, you know. It's It's very convincing and... It, it could be imagined as true because, I mean, it what they are accusing Tyrion of with Sansa and all the horrors that Sansa's had, like, this is not far, this is not far-fetched. Right. And uh, Tyrion's kind of a baller, you know, but uh, they're, she's making him seem really pathetic through this whole thing. You know, like, he could have gotten in Sansa's bed if, she, if he wanted to. She wasn't putting up a fight. It was his choice not to. And she's, mm -hmm. you know, she's painting him as being weak, like, oh, I want to, and getting shut down by Sansa. She's saying, like, oh, you know, Bronn did the dirty work. He came and broke the knight's arm and stole me. And Tyrion said, you belong to me now. I want you to fuck me like it's my last night in the world, in this world. <laughs> Which and I love. Everyone starts laughing. That's yeah, when he such goes, an Shay, yeah. don't. Yeah, and it's Please just... Please don't. It's, it, it's just excruciating watching Tyrion being humiliated in, the, humiliated in this manner, and his eyes are closed and his gaze is fixed downward, and he's just like... Like, he's just, like, shocked into... Like, you know, he's have been having outbursts this whole time, but he's broken at this point. He's, like, he's just curled up, and... Uh, it's fucking rough to watch. Especially think, after everything he's done to do to do good and you know save people and try to do the right thing and not rape Sansa and not kill Joffrey and it's just it's all kind fucked. of come back to bite him in this yeah you know trial as far as you know he could have raped Sansa and had her got her pregnant and you know that would have laid claim to in this situation that he's a Lannister and was doing right by his family. And I also feel, I feel torn with Shay interestingly enough in this scene, because there's a part of me that knows that she's doing it because she's just fucking pissed at him. Mm -hmm. But there are certain moments that she looks at Tyrion that. Or she doesn't, you can tell she doesn't want to be doing it. Yeah, she doesn't really want to be there. She's very nervous. She's right, like, like looking around. She's answering very quickly. Like, yes, I know this man, Tyrion Lannister. She's reading her script. Yeah, but she also like looks over at him a couple of times and has an interesting look on her face. Mm -hmm. It's not anger. I wouldn't say it's sympathy either, but it's not like... I mean, well, there there is a little bit of anger because remember, like she's like... You know, I would wait in his chambers for hours so he could come oh, use me when he was anger. bored. And, and she, he ordered me to call him my lion. I took his, I took his face in my hands and said, "I'm yours and you're mine." And he's like, "Shay, please don't." And then she looks at him and she's like, "I'm a whore. Remember, like what you said." Exactly. So she's like getting her revenge, but like she's torn. You can tell she's torn, and that that's the moment that I kind of saw it. It's like I'm mad at you, but I feel really bad because I know that what I'm saying out loud is a lie. Right, yeah. The moment that I saw that made me like think that she felt torn was when Tyrion demands a trial by combat and it looks, every, you get a glimpse of everybody's expressions and Shay mm -hmm. looks horrified. She, she looks does. fucking horrified. She's like, oh my God. But that was the moment for me where I was like, oh, she's not 100% in this, you know? Well, she knows she's lying because yeah. she knows yeah. that they didn't come to her and, you know, plot the murder of King Joffrey. She knows right. that that wasn't true. And yeah, I mean, she wants to get revenge because she's mad, but it's taken it a little far, you know, condemning him to death. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, she's certainly I completely 100 percent agree with you. She's angry at him. Yeah. Undeniable. But she's also like, I also know that I'm a lying bitch right now and <laughs> yeah. none of what i'm saying is true and i'm kind of sorry for that like i'm yeah. mad at you but i'm kind of sorry that i'm throwing you under the bus and you're gonna die for it yeah so like we were saying she she weaves a pretty convincing tale here and uh that you know 
After he married Sansa, all, all he wanted was her, but she wouldn't let him into her bed, so he promised to kill King Joffrey for her. And uh, that's when Tyrion is just like, I've had enough of this bullshit, you know? And things come in twos in this show. Like, two, two murderous weddings, two trial by combats for Tyrion, Tyrion being held in, in captivity twice, and two confessions, two like false confessions by Tyrion, where he That's confesses true. to crimes that he like that aren't he's not on trial for. So this is when Father, I wish to confess to confess. I wish to confess, you know, and Jamie's like, What the fuck are you doing? He looks so mad. Like I, yeah, I just gave like, up all this stuff for you and you're fucking it up. You're fucking it up. Just go with the script, you know, follow the plan. And he's like, he's like you, Tywin's like, you wish to confess? And he's like, I saved you. I saved the city and all your worthless lives. I should have let Stannis kill you all. And he, he goes Everyone's on. Everyone's like, boo! Yeah, he's like, Tyrion, do you wish to confess? Yes, father, I'm guilty. Is that what you want to hear? You admit you poisoned the king? You know, just like Liza says, you admit to to murdering or whatever he's accused of, Robin Aaron or something? And he's like, no, of that I'm innocent. <laughs> but I do admit to, to <laughs> what is it, Shake, um, squeezing his one-eyed snake into the turtle soup or whatever. <laughs> you know, like, goes through all those, yeah. all those horrible things he, he did. He confesses to, like, what he's not... Stealing clothes from bathing women and, yeah, things that he's not being accused of at the moment. Exactly. Which is hilarious. So, uh, we, he, like you said, you went through, a, like on trial for being a dwarf but then he goes on to say i wish i was the monster you think i am i wish i had enough poison for the whole pack of you i would gladly give my life to watch you all swallow it and then tywin starts calling sir marin sir marin like like order in the court you know escort the prisoner back to his cell and that's when he you know the 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 most powerful line of the whole episode i will you know i will not give my life for joffrey's murder and I know I'll get no justice here, so I will let the gods decide my fate. I demand a trial by combat. And that's just like, the shit hits the fan and every, dun, dun, it's like dun. an uproar in the whole place. <laughs> and everybody's freaking out and having like their dramatic reactions and the stare down of the century between the two of them. And it just cuts to black and the reins of Castamere plays. And that is one of the best endings of any episode in this series. Yes, I have to agree. This is a great episode. Just it's a legendary together. episode. This is one and of you the, know what like, I realized the big episodes. Is we don't see a wall in this episode. Yeah, true. No Jon Snow. We don't see Jon Snow. Which is sad. Yeah. That makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> you That's know great. how I feel about Jon Snow. Yeah. But yeah, so, I mean, that pretty much wraps up my notes on the trial. Same here. Yeah. Anything else you want to mention? The only other note that I had as far as themes go is this. See, um, this episode is called is called the laws of gods and men. And yep. we get a glimpse of Bravos and the bank. We get. A glimpse. These are my top five just briefly. You sure. know, so the laws of kind of like how money works, how debt works, how they're a looming threat. So that's a law in a way, in a, in a way. Then we have Varys who people call Lord Varys, but they're under no obligation to call me Lord. So, you know, that's kind of a law of men from a, you know, most Lords are actual Lords and Varys <laughs> is not right. a Lord. So that's kind of a, a broken law. Mm -hmm. And then we have kind of Theon's rescue and kind of the oppression that he feels, which sometimes people think, you know, laws are oppressive. And then we have the small council, which, you know, is kind of like a small governing system in King's Landing. And then we have the physical trial, which is because Tyrion broke the law, supposedly, and it's held you know, kind of under the seven pointed star. So I thought that the, you know, the theme of the laws of gods and men kind of placated throughout the entire episode. Right. And the Iron Bank too, with like Stannis claiming like the laws of men dictate that I, I'm the rightful king, you know, and oh, then, yeah. Yeah, and then good the point. bank like taking Tywin's side, but then 
being convinced by Davos and, you know, like, it, yeah, yeah, that's a great way to sort of sum up the whole episode. There, it's a vein that runs through the entire thing. And uh, I'll just say one more <laughs> thing to go out on something kind of funny. So Theon is rumored, you know, is, is, has a legendary cock, right? Big old cock. And uh, <laughs> just imagine how big the cock is on that Titan of Bravos. <laughs> that's kind of something that gets joked about in the book a little books a little bit oh really yeah, that's so funny. The, there's the scene where uh where Arya is on the ship arriving at bravos and they're about to sail under it <laughs> you know and, and maybe she finds oh out. and is she looking up <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if the that's statue funny. actually has a big like has a cock or not you know but just kind of a funny thing so <laughs> it should be like yeah it should be hanging out like a little <laughs> robe there <laughs> totally all right so let's take a little break and uh, we'll be right back the sky is crying can't you see the tears rolling down the street the sky is crying To see the tears rolling down the street. I've been looking for my baby, and I wonder where can she be. I saw my baby one morning She was walking on down the street I think I saw my baby this morning She was walking on down the street So bad Made my poor heart Skip a beat That's alright, I still got my guitar That's me on guitar and vocals, covering Stevie Ray Vaughan, The Sky is Crying. Recorded that just for this episode for you guys. And we're back with news about Game of Thrones. First, from Cinema Blend, J.J. Abrams would be honored to direct some of HBO's Game of Thrones prequel by Adrienne Jones. Unless you've been hiding under a very large rock since 2011, you know that HBO's Game of Thrones has millions upon millions of fans. One of those fans is director J.J. Abrams, and he says he'd be honored if he were asked to to get involved in one of the show's coming prequel series, but he does see a potential drawback for himself. He says, I'd be honored. I am in awe of what they do. They make movies every episode. I feel like like the truth is, I probably wouldn't want to get involved and demystify the thing. I just like watching it from the outside in. I've been lucky enough to work with some people. Mina Gold, who casts the show, who I've worked with a couple times now, and Gwendolyn Christie, who is in The Force Awakens. Anytime I hear about behind the scenes on that show, I feel like I want them to stop talking about it because I just love what they create. And I know exactly what J.J. Abrams is talking about here because I've been involved with like a lot of stuff 
um, relating to The Walking Dead. Like I've mm-hmm. I, I've worked at Walker Stalker Con for a, like a, a few years, and I've met everybody on The Walking Dead, you know, up till like season seven or whatever, and hung out with them. And like you know, I, I like it totally took the mystery away from the show. And so I've made a conscious decision not to like to make the same mistake with with Game of Thrones, <laughs> and like yeah. I've intent like I've met Gwendolyn Christie, but that's it, you know. And like I've intentionally like kind of not met them and like stayed away from from doing that whole thing. I actually I sort of met Nikolai Coster Waldo, uh, Jamie Lannister as well, very briefly. That's awesome. But. Uh, yeah, it's it. I like preserving the mystery because it's sort of you know I, when I end up watching The Walking Dead, I'm thinking about like, oh, it's so funny watching like um, Josh McDermott play Eugene when I like see him in my head talking like Josh McDermott. You know what I mean? Sure. You know, I can see how that kind of takes the luster out of it. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of yeah, exactly. So back to the article. It's always good to see someone who's reached such a high point in their career be filled with such admiration for what others do, especially if they're in the same field. And it's pretty obvious from J.J. Abrams' words to MTV International, who he, whom he spoke to in order to promote his new horror film, Over, Overlord, that he's a very big fan of the work that's done to bring Game of Thrones to fans. So J.J. Abrams is kind of like an A-list director. You know what I mean? A-list big movie director. Would like, Absolutely. I started saying over a decade ago that television would be the next like major medium um, like on screens and that I, I made a prediction that we'd start seeing big movie actors going to TV. This would be next level if we start seeing film directors start directing television episodes. Right. How crazy would that be? That would be very interesting. Very interesting to me. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. Absolutely. There's more of this article too. So if you guys want to read the rest of it, go to cinemablend.com and uh, you'll find it there. So our next article comes from Vanity Fair. Game of Thrones author drops a tantalizing spinoff hint, much to HBO's dismay by Joanna Robinson. It's no secret that HBO has severely heightened the security and secrecy of its final season of Game of of Game of Thrones, that tight control also seems to extend to the show's proposed spinoff, as author George R. R. Martin himself learned this week. <laughs> Martin has been excitedly and understandably spreading the news about the upcoming planned spinoff, which will be run by Jane Goldman, as well as some other potential series that are still in the works. But in his excitement, he may have overshared slightly <laughs> on his personal blog. <laughs> While promoting his upcoming Targaryen history book, Fire and Blood, out later this month, Martin heavily implied that one project in the works at HBO would be dragon-related. The author was then compelled to apologize and retract. (laughs) Interesting. Yeah. When commenting on the news that Naomi Watts would join the yet-untitled Thrones prequel series, Martin mistakenly mistakenly identified the show as having a title, The Long Night. Though that is what Martin has been informally calling the series and has been quite vocal that it's what he would like it to be called. He wrote this in a later post. HBO has informed me that Jane Goldman pilot is not yet titled The Long Night. That's certainly the title I prefer, but for the moment, the pilot is still officially untitled. So, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa. That's Latin, meaning I'm the culprit. Like, my bad, basically. Yep, my bad. <laughs> so, that's pretty funny. Yeah, I, I actually, we had recorded last week's episode before he made the retraction, um, saying that The Long Night is not officially the title yet. So, I, I, had, I had included in the news that it, the title was Long Night. And then I went in yes. afterwards and edited it and, 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 and fixed it, saying that, oh, technically, that's not the case yet. George yeah. has retracted that. That's very interesting. So it's, it's kind of foretelling, but it's mm-hmm. not, a, so we can't go by it. So, yeah. so back to the article. Um, more intriguing than this naming snafu, however, is the question of dragons. Before HBO spoke with Martin about the importance of secrecy, 
He teased this. Meanwhile, there are still a couple of other possible prequels in active development. I can't tell you the subject matter of those projects. No, sorry, I wish I could. The readers among you might want to grab a copy of Fire and Blood when it's released on November 20th, though. Ooh. I know, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Targaryens, dragons, it all makes sense. Yeah. (laughs) Martin didn't technically reveal that one of the potential Thrones spinoffs still in the works would would center on the dragon riders of his new book, but he certainly implied it. Man, that would be so fucking cool if it was the Dance of Dragons or something. Holy shit. Yes. That'd be expensive, man. Oh, man, for sure. Real expensive. <laughs> Next from sci-fi. What just happened? <laughs> <laughs> it was a joke. There's a um, there's a clip of comedian Bill Hicks, and he's talking about <laughs> people are gonna kick out of this. He's talking about um, drugs, basically, and he's like, "All oh, you people out there that you know think that drugs should be illegal, he's like, do yourself a favor and go home and take all those beautiful records that you love that have enhanced your life." that these m- brilliant musicians have created that have made you so happy and burn them. Cause all those, all those people that you love that recorded all that beautiful music, <laughs> real fucking high <laughs> on drugs, but it <laughs> the, like the, uh, it makes it's, he made it like real close to the microphone, uh, made it sound like a bong. <laughs> oh, okay. So. Oh, okay. That's yeah, funny. Pretty classic, yeah. So ne- next from sci-fi.com, that's S-Y-F-Y, like the uh, TV channel. Two rival marching bands form an alliance for one incredible Game of Thrones tribute by Christian Long. Winter may be coming, but that didn't stop two rival schools' respective marching bands from forging an alliance for an inspired eight-plus-minute tribute to Game of Thrones. During the halftime show at a game between the University of Michigan and Penn State University, both schools' marching bands joined forces for an epic rendition of a handful of the blockbuster fantasy series' best-known orchestral numbers. There was even a bit of narration between songs, while the bands pulled off some seriously impressive choreography. And I saw a still frame, and they, like, the band... The two bands combined were covering the entire football field in the shape of a giant dragon. That's amazing. So I, I love football or like college marching bands. Yes. I'm a total nerd. But no, they no, are no. Amazing. They're amazing. There's like a really famous Ohio State one where yes. they do all the video game covers and stuff. I'm sure you've seen it. And they're Me like, too. they do like the horse from Zelda, like running down the field, moving its legs and everything. So I bet this is similar where like the dragon's like doing stuff. And uh, I'm going to post the uh, the video on our YouTube, on our um our Facebook page, so you guys can all check it out. I'm sure it's fucking amazing. I just haven't gotten a chance to watch it yet, but I want to. I'm going to watch it as soon as we're done with this. So, <laughs> Continuing, starting off with the show's main title, the band goes to Reigns of Castamere slash Light of the Seven, Rain slash Spoils of War, and ending with Winds of Winter slash Misa. Oh, awesome. All, yeah. All while Westeros was recreated via sigils of House Stark, House Lannister, and a dragon. Like the formations of the band on the field. Sure. They also That's amazing. So I wanna, amazing. You said that this is on. We're gonna post this. Yeah, I'll, I'll post awesome. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to watch. I'll it. send you okay. a link first because this won't get released probably for a couple of days. You know, so I'll I'll send awesome. you a link first so you. Can yeah, watch it. I want to see this. This is amazing. Oh yeah. They also did a pretty faithful recreation of the opening credits. Fucking radical! While this dun, performance. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Dun, 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 God, that song's cool. <laughs> While this performance is definitely not canon, it's a noteworthy addition to the Game of Thrones musical history. Over its seven-season run, the show has featured cameos from musicians ranging from Mastodon, which is a brutal metal band, to Ed Sheeran. Even Icelandic av- avant-rockers Sigur Rós got heckled during their era-appropriate rendition of Reigns of Castamere at King Joffrey's wedding where he was later poisoned and died a horrible death. Ah, memories. The downside here, of course, is that we won't be seeing the final season of Game of Thrones until sometime in the first half of next year. This, the epic fantasy series will close out with a six-episode run with each installment having the scope, the budgets, and the runtimes of a full feature-length production, 
which was actually closer to the show's plan at one point. And uh, yeah, we'll post that link on Facebook for you guys to watch because it's amazing. I can't wait to see that. <laughs> oh, yeah. See. Next, we'll move on to our Game of Thrones and history. Continuing the article we covered began covering last week from Bustle, the 10 most clever literary references in the Game of Thrones books by Charlotte Allen. First, Martin loves the Wheel of Time. A Song of Ice and Fire features a whole slew of subtle references to the fantasy, fantasy series The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan. Archmaester Rigney theorizes that time is shaped like a wheel, and James Oliver Rigney Jr. was Robert Jordan's real name. And then there's the delightfully obvious mention of Lord Trebor Jordan of the Tor. Tor was the publisher of most of Jordan's books. Um, I heard that a couple years ago it was announced that there was supposed to be a Wheel of Time TV show in in the works at like Amazon Prime or Netflix or one of those things. I can't remember, but worth looking into. It's uh, people who like Game of uh, A Song of Ice and Fire tend to have a you know really high respect for the Wheel of Time series. So I imagine that would be a really cool series as well. Awesome. Yeah, I'll have to look into that. Yeah. Okay. Harry gets a nasty forehead scar. In A Clash of Kings, Brienne of Tarth fights both Harry Sawyer and Robin Potter, giving Harry a nasty scar on his forehead. Harry and Potter are both rude characters, but Martin has gone on record saying that he appreciates all that J.K. Rowling has done for the fantasy genre, even if she beat him at the Hugo Awards. Oh, <laughs> brutal. That's great. Next, all hobbits must die. There are a lot of subtle nods to J.R.R. Tolkien in George R.R. R. Martin's work. I mean, just his name references J.R.R. R. Tolkien, right? The R.R.R.R. All those R's. R. 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 <laughs> Sam Tarley and Sam Gam Gamgee share a lot of character traits, and both the authors use the names Oakenshield, Drogo, and Theoden. Most oh, notable, though... Yeah, most notable, though, the phrase Valar Morghulis is repeated throughout Martin's books, meaning all men must die. The Valar are deities in Tolkien, Tolkien's world, and Minus Morghul is a fortress, with Morghul meaning dark sorcery. Cool. Oh, my goodness. That's interesting. Yeah. All these, you know, all these things encrypted into George R.R. R. Martin's books. It's nuts. It's insane. Yeah. Like, I know we've talked about this before. Like, some of it, I'm sure, is on purpose, but some of it has to just be coincidence. Yeah, uh, maybe. It's <laughs> overwhelming. It's, yeah. Like, it, implementing historical references plus fiction references. Mythology, all of it. astronomy. And it's, I know, it's all working together in this beautiful masterpiece, and this is why we podcast about it. Yeah, and this <laughs> is what you call the grand tradition, is writing in this, in this uh, fashion. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so Joffrey is a biblical. <laughs> <laughs> Joffrey is a biblicky. Oh. <laughs> this is gonna be horrible. I might just keep this in the podcast. It's so funny. <laughs> Joffrey is a biblically bad king. <laughs> That's as good as it's gonna get. <laughs> While young Joffrey is king, he, but mostly his mother, has all of the previous King Robert's bastards put to death. This involves massacring infants because King Robert really got around. Joffrey's decree mirrors similar decrees in the Bible. In the Gospel of Matthew, King Herod tries to have all the male babies killed to prevent the rise of Jesus and an exodus. The Pharaoh has all the male Hebrew babies put to death to prevent a rebellion. I guess this means that all of Robert's surviving bastards are going to team up and part the narrow sea. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Yeah, what is that with, like, putting goat's blood on your door or something? To, mm -hmm. But f yep. firstborns getting killed? Yeah. I don't remember exactly, but, yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Oh, this says that Joffrey, but mostly his mother, has all the... But Robert's bastards put to death. But when Tyrion conf confronts Cersei about it on the show, she seems to think her surprise indicates to Tyrion that Joffrey ordered it. I agree with that. I don't necessarily think it was Cersei. I yeah. think it was Joffrey that 
that it took the initiative and before it he goes you know father had other children like he's questioning it right yeah so. very biblical good good uh connection there too for sure. i can't believe i uh, joffrey is a biblically bad king that's <laughs> so hard for me to say <laughs> biblically little blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I am Baymax, your personal healthcare companion. Oh man, you can keep it in there if you want. All right, <laughs> it's just so. I, I think funny. people will get a kick out of our like reactions to it. That's cool. <laughs> um, what, what's that noise? You hear that? Caw, caw. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Matthew of House Rep. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Tyrion's world just crumbled. He knew that Tywin, Cersei, and all their sycophants would give damning testimony, but Shay's reappearance in King's Landing and her betrayal of him is gut-wrenching. Stannis gets two steps closer to his goal by making deals with both the Iron Bank and with Davos' old pirating friend Salador to gain both men and ships to transport them. They'll come in handy, too, in a few episodes north of the Wall. Oh yeah. I believe this is right around where we see Theon at his absolute lowest. Oh, true statement. Oh, yeah. He is so far gone as Reek that he doesn't accept help from Yara and soon betrays the Ironborn at Moat Kaelin. It's only after Sansa arrives back at Winterfell that the old Theon is reawakened. I love that. And thank you, yep. Sir Matthew, for being a you know, consistent contributor to Raven's Calls. You yes. You have really great feedback. Yeah, we love you. Just like Theon loves Ramsay. I mean, <laughs> you love me. <laughs> do you love me? <laughs> I do. I love you so much. Luke the Low Duke. That's an awesome name. Oh, yeah. There's a key moment I hadn't noticed before between Varys and Oberyn. When Varys is asked what he wants, he says nothing but looks pointedly at the throne. King Varys? King Varys. It's, ah, man, Wait, imagine that if he gets Danny all like, up there and then betrays her at the last minute and like stabs her through the, through the heart or oh something God. and sits on the Could throne himself. Because he, he is for the realm. <laughs> right. Yeah, for the watch. For the realm! <laughs> stabs her. Maybe for the watch is uh, foreshadowing for the realm. <laughs> right? Oh my goodness. Oh, man. Lord Axel Erickson. That's a badass name, too. Really like Varys, I forget nothing during the trial when Tyrion thinks he's been abandoned by Varys. Yeah, that was a really brutal moment, man. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Lady Sarah of House Larkham. This is one of Peter Dinklage's finest moments as an actor where he tells everybody that during the Battle of the Blackwater, how he stepped up when Joffrey abandoned his army and how he thought of the wildfire of the wildfire to hurt Stannis's army and how his whole life he has been on trial all his life for being a dwarf. <laughs> we see the introduction of Tycho Nestoris. Yep. The, the representative okay, we see the induction of Tycho Nestoris, the representative of the Iron Bank. Yeah. So that's his name. Okay, I didn't yeah. realize we knew his name. That's awesome. Yeah, I forgot that he got introduced this early actually. But we see him later. He ends up at the wall meeting with uh, John and Stannis again, I believe, and everything. Um, yeah. Lady Lucy of House Jane. I forgot that Jamie sells his soul to Tywin for Sir Tyrion's life. Jamie's amazing. Well, when he's not being controlled by Cersei. And I despise Shay. She is vile, and it hurts my heart to see Tyrion so broken. I know. It is sad. Yeah, it's pretty rough. Pretty rough. Okay, Lord Pete of House Clark, and this is in response to Game of Microphones episode 77. Dark Sister Sword Talk, track marker 123.00. Yeah, 123 minutes. In the future episode, The Door, quote unquote spoilers, Mira Reed grabs a sword next to the door when running out of the cave. It's just a, sword, a sword propped up there with the spider webs on it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. I know where he's going with this. Very interesting. Blood Raven did take it to the wall, as far as we know. The Night's Watch doesn't look like they have it. Dark Sister, yeah. 
He might have placed it in this cave, then later had trees grow out of him. Then Mirror brings it south, not knowing at the time what it is until someone looks at it. Season 6, Episode 5, The Door, at 47 minutes and 5 seconds, you can see it for yourself. She uses it in combat to good effect against the dead, even pairing a White Walker stroke. Oh my gosh. What the fuck? I didn't even think about this. This is awesome. Yeah. She made it glow bright white from contact. Ooh. Oh. I'm like, my mind is blown right now. As yeah, I'm same here. <laughs> In that one-on-one fight, she strikes but does not penetrate the center of the breastplate, but instead used dragon glass to, to devastating effect. Combat was a very dark and kinetic so you can't see everything going on. Dude, oh my goodness! Dude. I'm so watching that episode. Yeah, like tonight. <laughs> totally. Yeah, that's that is crazy, awesome. Man. Thank really, you, Lord Pete. Yeah, great catch. That's yeah. That's gonna be very interesting to analyze further. I hope it turns out to to mean something. You know, to maybe that it is Dark Sister or something like that. That'd be epic. And I love that it's if it is true that that's what it is like it's all just old and covered in cobwebs and it right. comes back to life when it touches the white walkers weapon right and the only reason we didn't see it kill the white walkers because the didn't penetrate the armor and actually touch the white walkers body yeah oh you my know God. like damn dude i remember that moment Amazing. where she tries to stab it and it like doesn't penetrate and then she like does something else like shoots an arrow or something yeah, and it's just such a crazy, chaotic scene that I didn't even realize that she even... just picked up a random sword. Right, yeah, yeah. It's like so a, much is happening. A, she uses a bow most times, so the fact that she like had to grab a weapon that's better in closed quarters, and it's just a random sword in the cave, that's amazing. Yeah, really good catch. Really good catch. Looking forward to reviewing that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody, for your feedback. We love it. Right, that's our show, episode 78. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, guys, so much. We love your feedback and love that you continue to listening to our ramblings. <laughs> Next episode, we'll be covering season four, episode seven, Mockingbird. Give it a watch and send us your thoughts. We'd love to read them on the air. And holiday season is approaching. So if you'd like to support Game of Microphones without spending any extra money, you can. Just go to GameOfMicrophones.com and click our link to Amazon. While all the prices will remain the same, Game of Microphones will receive a little finder's fee from Amazon for everything you buy in that session for directing, for directing you to their site. It's super easy to do, doesn't cost you a penny more, and makes a huge difference for us. Like I said, we've been operating in a deficit, so <laughs> it's important that we start to try to monetize this operation so we can stay around. And this way, you don't even have to spend any extra money. If you'd like to call, you can always call us at 813-JOFFREY. That's 813-563-3739. If you would like to write in, you can email us at ravens at gameofmicrophones.com. Check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash gompodcast. And uh, please, if you can, give us a like on Facebook and a rating. So you guys know, after the hiatus, we're no longer appearing in the search results for Game of Thrones on iTunes. So please, go and give us a five-star review on iTunes to help bump us back up into the search results. We'd really appreciate it, big time. Yes, please do that. That would be so amazing. Yeah. I think what we're going to do is have a contest. We're going to draw, you know, every everybody that gives us a review will be entered into the contest and we'll draw a winner and uh, have a guest host so oh, i love that i love that idea yeah so if you guys want to hop on the show with us go give us a review and you'll be entered into our contest we'd really appreciate it yes Imp slab. Oh. you can also listen to game of microphones on youtube just search for game of microphones to find our channel we can't create a custom URL until we have 100 subscribers, so please subscribe as well. Likes, comments, and shares are also appreciated. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at GOM Podcast, and we're now trying to have a presence on pretty much all available social media and video platforms, so 
Now you can find us on Gab and Minds, which are Twitter and Facebook alternatives as well, both at GOM Podcast. And on BitChute, Steemit, and Reel.Video as Game of Microphones as well. Those are all YouTube alternatives. We figured we might as well just put our content, content out everywhere we can to try to increase our reach and presence. We're also on Tumblr at Game of Microphones. Yes, we are. And uh, Election Day just happened in Morston, Texas, where my character Malik Husto is running for mayor on the serial horror drama podcast Sirenicide. So, if you want to support Malik Husto, me, for mayor, give us your vote by going and listening to this episode, Season 3, Episode 13 of Sirenicide. And you can help support our guest Johnny Stitches as well. And he's going to be joining us in two episodes to talk about the mountain and the viper. So get ready for that, because he's fun to have as a guest as well. Yes. While you're at it, go to weirdleatherandmead.com and help support our our frequent guest host, Travis, as well, with his Kickstarter to help get his meadery up and running. I know they're over halfway to their goal, and there's just a few days left with their Kickstarter, so anything uh, you guys can do to help out would be much appreciated. I know I'd like to taste his mead, so that would be awesome. I can't wait. I frequent going up to Portland, Oregon oh, fairly really? often, so I'm so looking forward to visiting his shop. Yeah, that's great. That's yes. so cool. End credits music features Play the Game by Mon Placer and O'Nairi by Kai Engel. All right, that's our show, everybody. Thanks for listening. Prince Oberyn. Lord Varys? Only Varys. I'm not actually a nobleman. No one is under obligation to call me lord. And yet, everyone does. That's old as fuck for Westeros. Jamie's in the King's Guard. Cersei's crazy. <laughs> Bring me my brown pants. By popular demand. For real? Like, that's, that's really weird, man. Thank you! Windows tinted on my ride when I drive. <laughs> Windows tinted on my ride when I drive in it. So when I rob a bank, run out and just dive in it. And I'll be disguised in it. So if anybody identifies the guy in it, I'll hide for five minutes. Come back, shoot the eyewitness. Fire at the private eye, hire to pry in my business. <laughs> Sorry. Chupacabra. <laughs> <laughs> Watching your vicious bastard die gave me more relief than a thousand lying whores. <laughs> I fucking know those are your kids, you motherfucker. You're gonna have some Lannister kids, you son of a bitch, you know? Yes. And when I spoke out in the king's defense, <laughs> he threatened to have me killed. There we found residue of the most horrible poison of all, the strangler. This is not far-fetched. Tyrion's kind of a baller, you know? I will not give my life for Joffrey's murder, and I know I'll get no justice here, so I will let the gods decide my fate. I demand a trial by combat. Arr, 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 arr. Arr, 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 arr.